capital of India. Indian Research Fund Association or IRFA was born with the mandate to promote medical research in the country. IRFA was renamed as Indian Council of Medical Research or ICMR in 1949. With Pan India presence through its affiliated institutes and field stations, today ICMR is the apex body in biomedical research in India. All of them are tirelessly working together to overcome fatal human diseases through path-breaking research. When tuberculosis was a threat, the scientists at ICMR tested and validated DOCS, which has cured millions of patients suffering from TB. When leprosy struck millions, ICMR scientists tested the multidrug therapy with success. When diarrheal diseases become a leading cause of child death and suffering, ICMR facilitated and scale up the low-cost oral rehydration therapy and successfully worked on an indigenous vaccine for rotavirus-related diarrhea. When malaria became an everyday fear, ICMR tested new drugs and diagnostics and demonstrated bioenvironmental approaches to control malaria. From landmark studies in the area of nutrition, like double fortification of cooking salt with iron and iodine, assessment of nutritive values of Indian foods, micronutrient supplement formulations to design, plan, monitor and evaluate cancer registry activities under the National Cancer Registry Program. Other areas under non-communicable diseases included in diab study for diabetes and hypertension. With the growing human population, new drug-resistant strains have also emerged and pose serious problem in complete cure of the infections. Constant research in this area is the need of the hour. ICMR has created a network of antimicrobial resistance network to monitor drug-resistant organisms, various etiological issues and genes involved in this mechanism to help in better drug delivery and formulating appropriate drug policy. From time to time, ICMR has released guidelines on various important issues along with maintaining a clinical trial registry to improve transparency and accountability. ICMR has played an integral role in touching lives of every Indian in more ways than one. Development of commercial diagnostic kits against dengue and chikungunya. Direct agglutination test for early diagnosis of Kalazar. Development of vaccine against Kyasanur forest disease and Japanese encephalitis. Affordable glucometer and strips for diabetes. Magnifying device for cervical cancer screening. Personal protective equipment for salt workers. And these are only a few examples. With the changing global scenario, ICMR is well equipped to deal with the emerging and re-emerging diseases with advanced and state-of-the-art laboratories and research facilities with the highest and most stringent biosafety levels. Moreover, ICMR supports and nurtures the best scientific minds in the country by providing ample opportunities through fellowships, grants, training programs and infrastructure support. ICMR has been ensuring that India is at par with its research across the world, leaving no stone unturned. Over the years, ICMR has collaborated with widely renowned international institutes for disease prevention and healthcare. The new initiatives of ICMR, like India TB Research Consortium, Malaria Elimination Project, Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network, India Africa Health Platform, etc are in line with ICMR's mission of promoting better health in India through research. All these years, with ceaseless efforts and dogged determination, health research has supported government programs, which has resulted in increasing the life expectancy, eradicating the diseases like polio, neonatal tetanus, guinea worm, and have helped in controlling many diseases. And behind this determination lies a belief that development and economic growth of a nation depends on the well-being of its citizens. In future as well, ICMR is committed to strengthen its research to a new direction with an aim to translate the needs emerging out from research to action for benefit to the society. 
as well as help in introduction of affordable, indigenous technologies into health system. The ICMR Strategic Plan 2017-24 will prove to be a roadmap and guide in achieving short, medium and long-term health goals. Charak, the ancient Ayurvedic physician, believed that the wise should not accept anything without investigation. These wise words of Charak have been the guiding principles driving the health research discourse of Indian Council of Medical Research. The conflict between health and diseases has been eternal. Good health brings happiness and diseases bring sickness and death. Back in 1911, when M.K. Gandhi was yet to become a Mahatma, and New Delhi was 20 years away from being named capital of India. Indian Research Fund Association, or IRFA, was born with the mandate to promote medical research in the country. IRFA was renamed as Indian Council of Medical Research, or ICMR, in 1949. With Pan-India presence through its affiliated institutes and field stations, today ICMR is the apex body in biomedical research in India. All of them are tirelessly working together to overcome fatal human diseases through path-breaking research. When tuberculosis was a threat, the scientists at ICMR tested and validated DOCS, which has cured millions of patients suffering from TB. When leprosy struck millions, ICMR scientists tested the multidrug therapy with success. When diarrheal diseases become a leading cause of child death and suffering, ICMR facilitated and scale up for low-cost oral rehydration therapy and successfully worked on an indigenous vaccine for rotavirus-related diarrhea. When malaria became an everyday fear, ICMR tested new drugs and diagnostics and demonstrated bioenvironmental approaches to control malaria. From landmark studies in the area of nutrition, like double fortification of cooking salt with iron and iodine, assessment of nutritive values of Indian foods, micronutrient supplement formulations to design, plan, monitor and evaluate cancer registry activities under the National Cancer Registry Program. Other areas under non-communicable diseases included INDIAB study for diabetes and hypertension. With the growing human population, new drug-resistant strains have also emerged and pose serious problem in complete cure of the infections. Constant research in this area is the need of the hour. ICMR has created a network of antimicrobial resistance network to monitor drug-resistant organisms, various etiological issues and genes involved in this mechanism to help in better drug delivery and formulating appropriate drug policy. From time to time, ICMR has released guidelines on various important issues along with maintaining a clinical trial registry to improve transparency and accountability. ICMR has played an integral role in touching lives of every Indian in more ways than one. Development of commercial diagnostic kits against dengue and chikungunya. Direct agglutination test for early diagnosis of Kalazar. Development of vaccine against Kyasanur forest disease and Japanese encephalitis. Affordable glucometer and strips for diabetes. Magnifying device for cervical cancer screening. Personal protective equipment for source workers. And these are only a few examples. With the changing global scenario, ICMR is well equipped to see. Good afternoon, everyone. Can I be here? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will be starting the proceedings shortly. So whoever's here, I'd request you. Thank you, first of all, for, for, uh, for coming here, and thank you for your patience. And uh, I will rec start to request people outside uh, to come in and take their seats. So we hope to start in the next uh, five or seven minutes. Thank you. Anything without investigation. These wise words of Charak 
have been the guiding principles driving the health research discourse of Indian Council of Medical Research. The conflict between health and diseases has been eternal. Good health brings happiness and diseases bring sickness and death. Back in 1911, when M.K. Gandhi was yet to become a Mahatma and New Delhi was 20 years away from being named capital of India, Indian Research Fund Association or IRFA was born with the mandate to promote medical research in the country. IRFA was renamed as Indian Council of Medical Research or ICMR in 1949. With Pan-India presence through its affiliated institutes and field stations, today ICMR is the apex body in biomedical research in India. All of them are tirelessly working together to overcome fatal human diseases through path-breaking research. When tuberculosis was a threat, the scientists at ICMR tested and validated DOCS, which has cured millions of patients suffering from TB. When leprosy struck millions, ICMR scientists tested the multidrug therapy with success. When diarrheal diseases become a leading cause of child death and suffering, ICMR facilitated and scale up for low-cost oral rehydration therapy and successfully worked on an indigenous vaccine for rotavirus-related diarrhea. When malaria became an everyday fear, ICMR tested new drugs and diagnostics and demonstrated bioenvironmental approaches to control malaria. From landmark studies in the area of nutrition, like double fortification of cooking salt with iron and iodine, assessment of nutritive values of Indian foods, micronutrient supplement formulations to design, plan, monitor and evaluate cancer registry activities under the National Cancer Registry Program. Other areas under non-communicable diseases included INDIAB study for diabetes and hypertension. With the growing human population, new drug-resistant strains have also emerged and pose serious problem in complete cure of the infections. Constant research in this area is the need of the hour. ICMR has created a network of antimicrobial resistance network to monitor drug-resistant organisms, various etiological issues and genes involved in this mechanism to help in better drug delivery and formulating appropriate drug policy. From time to time, ICMR has released guidelines on various important issues along with maintaining a clinical trial registry to improve transparency and accountability. ICMR has played an integral role in touching lives of every Indian in more ways than one. Development of commercial diagnostic kits against dengue and chikungunya direct agglutination test for early diagnosis of Kalazar, development of vaccine against Kyasanur forest disease and Japanese encephalitis, affordable glucometer and strips for diabetes, magnifying device for cervical cancer screening, personal protective equipment for salt workers, and these are only a few examples. With the changing global scenario, ICMR is well equipped to deal with the emerging and re-emerging diseases with advanced and state-of-the-art laboratories and research facilities with the highest and most stringent biosafety levels. Moreover, ICMR supports and nurtures the best scientific minds in the country by providing ample opportunities through fellowships, grants, training programs and infrastructure support. ICMR has been ensuring that India is at par with its research across the world, leaving no stone unturned. Over the years, ICMR has collaborated with widely renowned international institutes for disease prevention and healthcare. The new initiatives of ICMR, like India TB Research Consortium, Malaria Elimination Project, Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance Network, India Africa Health Platform, etc are in line with ICMR's mission of promoting better health in India through research. All these years, with ceaseless efforts and dogged determination, health research has supported government programs, which has resulted in increasing the life expectancy, eradicating the diseases like polio, neonatal tetanus, guinea worm, and have helped in controlling many diseases. And behind this determination lies a belief that development 
and economic growth of a nation depends on the well-being of its citizens. In future as well, ICMR is committed to strengthen its research to a new direction with an aim to translate the leads emerging out from research to action for benefit to the society as well as help in introduction of affordable indigenous technologies into health system. The ICMR Strategic Plan 2017-24 to will prove to be a roadmap and guide in achieving short, medium and long-term health goals. Charak, the ancient Ayurvedic physician, believed that the wise should not accept anything without investigation. These wise words of Charak have been the guiding principles driving the health research discourse of Indian Council of Medical Research. The conflict between health and diseases has been eternal. Good health brings happiness and diseases bring sickness and death. Back in 1911, when M.K. Gandhi was yet to become a Mahatma and New Delhi was 20 years away from being named capital of India, Indian Research Fund Association, or IFA. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, my apologies, but uh, we are running five or ten minutes behind. We're just waiting for Professor Dr. Bhargava and Professor Dr. V.K. Paul as well to arrive. So as soon as they do arrive, uh, I think we'll be able to get started. Thank you. believe that the wise should not accept anything without investigation. These wise words of Charak have been the guiding principles driving the health research discourse of Indian Council of Medical Research. The conflict between health and diseases has been eternal. Good health brings happiness and diseases bring sickness and death. Back in 1911, when M.K. Gandhi was yet to become a Mahatma and New Delhi was 20 years away from being named capital of India, Indian Research Fund Association, or IRFA, was born with the mandate to promote medical research in the country. IRFA was renamed as Indian Council of Medical Research, or ICMR, in 1949. With pan-India presence through its affiliated institutes and field stations, Today, ICMR is the apex body in biomedical research in India. All of them are tirelessly working together to overcome fatal human diseases through path-breaking research. When tuberculosis was a threat, the scientists at ICMR tested and validated docs. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us what a virus can do, how it can wreak havoc on lives and livelihoods and bring the entire world to a standstill. Across the globe, scientists, health workers, governments, pharmaceutical companies and industries have worked hand in hand to tackle this problem. In India, the Apex Biomedical Research Body, the Indian Council of Medical Research, or ICMR, has been at the helm of COVID-19 response. At the outset of the pandemic, ICMR facilitated testing in laboratories with a mission to ensure that tests are available and accessible to every person in the country. Today, testing has increased exponentially with 3,000 labs providing COVID-19 diagnosis in even the remotest parts of the country. The Council has also provided evidence-based prevention, management and diagnosis guidelines and advisories to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Our scientists are researching to ensure that data is available to help tackle every problem that comes with the disease. We have built a simulator to ascertain what factors could be responsible for the third surge of SARS-CoV-2 infections at the district and state levels in the country and how vaccination rates will affect this surge. 
But the most incredible achievement in this pandemic is the development of a safe and effective vaccine in 10 months. ICMR, in partnership with an Indian manufacturer, Bharat Biotech, took on the strenuous task of developing an indigenous solution. In this partnership, both of us are working on public health goods. Whether industry or ICMR or NIV, all of us are working only to help the community at large, our country at large, our society at large. ICMR has also worked with multiple partners to deliver these vaccines through innovative mechanisms such as drones increasing accessibility of the vaccine in the remotest corners of the country. Today, more than 110 million Covaxin doses have been administered to Indian people, which has helped the country cross over the milestone of providing 1 billion vaccination doses. We at ICMR are future ready, committed to drawing upon the country's brightest minds to provide cutting edge solutions to health challenges so that we can move forward for a safer and healthier world. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us what a virus can do, how it can wreak havoc on lives and livelihoods and bring the entire world to a standstill. Across the globe, scientists, health workers, governments, pharmaceutical companies and industries have worked hand in hand to tackle this problem. In India, the Apex Biomedical Research Body, the Indian Council of Medical Research, or ICMR, has been at the helm of COVID-19 response. At the outset of the pandemic, ICMR facilitated testing in laboratories with a mission to ensure that tests are available and accessible to every person in the country. Today, testing has increased exponentially with 3,000 labs providing COVID-19 diagnosis in even the remotest parts of the country. The Council has also provided evidence-based prevention, management and diagnosis guidelines and advisories to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Our scientists are researching to ensure that data is available to help tackle every problem that comes with the disease. We have built a simulator to ascertain what factors could be responsible for the third surge of SARS-CoV-2 infections at the district and state levels in the country and how vaccination rates will affect this surge. But the most incredible achievement in this pandemic is the development of a safe and effective vaccine in 10 months. ICMR, in partnership with an...
shown us what a virus can do, how it can wreak havoc on lives and livelihoods and bring the entire world to a standstill. Across the globe, scientists, health workers, governments, pharmaceutical companies and industries have worked hand in hand to tackle this problem. In India, the Apex Biomedical Research Body, the Indian Council of Medical Research or ICMR has been at the helm of COVID-19 response. At the outset of the pandemic, ICMR facilitated testing in laboratories with a mission to ensure that tests are available and accessible to every person in the country. Today, testing has increased exponentially with 3,000 labs providing COVID-19 diagnosis in even the remotest parts of the country. The Council has also provided evidence-based prevention, management and diagnosis guidelines and advisories to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Our scientists are researching to ensure that data is available to help tackle every problem that comes with the disease. We have built a simulator to ascertain what factors could be responsible for the third surge of SARS-CoV-2 infections at the district and state levels in the country and how vaccination rates will affect this surge. But the most incredible achievement in this pandemic is the development of a safe and effective vaccine in 10 months. ICMR, in partnership with an Indian manufacturer, Bharat Biotech, took on the strenuous task of developing an indigenous solution. In this partnership, both of us are working on public health goods, whether industry or ICMR or NIV, all of us are working only to help the community at large, our country at large, our society at large. ICMR has also worked with multiple partners to deliver these vaccines through innovative mechanisms, such as drones, increasing accessibility of the vaccine in the remotest corners of the country. Today, more than 110 million Covaxin doses have been administered to Indian people which has helped the country cross over the milestone of providing 1 billion vaccination doses. We at ICMR are future ready, committed to drawing upon the country's brightest minds to provide cutting edge solutions to health challenges so that we can move forward for a safer and healthier world. The pandemic has shown us how the entire world can be brought to a standstill by a microscopic virus and underlined a fact that scientists and public health experts have already known. In this connected world, we cannot take the health of our countries and our populations for granted. Now more than ever, we need urgent, innovative solutions rooted in scientific excellence to tackle health challenges today and in the future. In India, ICMR has been at the helm of health for over a hundred years now, building on its roots as a fund to research tropical diseases it has evolved to become the premier institute for health research, carrying out pioneering work that is changing the face of our country's public health. From monitoring and Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, once again, thank you so much for being here and taking the times out of your very busy schedules to actually join us uh, for this uh, um, extremely important uh, meeting today. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Indira Bihara. I'm Vice President at Global Health Strategies. And um, allow me to welcome you to the ICMR Health Communications Conclave for us to connect and collaborate 
um, organized in association with global health strategies. As communications and health leaders and experts in our field, we often talk about how communication plays a significant role in improving health outcomes for individuals, communities, and the nation as a whole. Today, we're going to hear from a stellar lineup of speakers on their experiences, learnings, and insights, and all the little details that we don't actually come across when they're doing their work to know how they actually achieved some of the mammoth movements that they have over the last few years. Let's get this uh, meeting started. And uh, uh, to begin with, of course, uh, as is one, we will be starting with the lighting of the ceremonial lamp. Uh, I'd like to invite Professor Dr. Balram Bhargava, Secretary, Department of Health Research, Government of India, and Director General, Indian Council of Medical Research. Uh, please, sir, would you be able to make your way to the lamp? And uh, Professor Dr. B.K. Paul, uh, Member Niti Aayog. Thank you, sir. Dr. Rajni Kant, Director, Regional Medical Research Center, Gorakhpur, and Head Policy and Communications, ICMR Headquarters. Uh, Ms. Anjali Nair, Executive Vice President, Global Health Strategies. And of course, Mr. Kaushik Bose, Vice President, Global Health Strategies. Thank you so much, everyone. So namaskar, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, let's begin by, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Dr. Balram Bhargava, uh, Secretary, Department of Health Research, and uh, Director General of the ICMR, uh, to please, sir, whenever you're ready, uh, do join us uh, on the dais uh, to say a few words to welcome our guests today. As you all know, Professor Dr. Bhargava is one of the foremost leaders in biomedical innovation, public health and cardiology, and medical research. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Behra. Uh, dear friends, Professor Paul, member Niti Aayog, Dr. Bang, Dr. Pandav, the directors of all ICMR institutes, the ICMR family, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all those people who have joined virtually. It's a pleasure with such a beautiful window behind you, such lovely greenery. So in, in this, the pressings of this India International Center to this very important meeting on uh, this conclave on health communications. I think um, the COVID has put us into a momentum that uh, we are all in, uh, uh, I mean, a different force 
the acceleration is different. I mean, Newton's second law of force is equal to mass into acceleration. So the mass has remained the same, but the acceleration has become much different for all of us. So I think we should maintain that if we are to deal with various diseases that are in our country and if we are going to reach the SDG 2030 mandate. What COVID has taught us that uh, in terms of health communication, we were probably above average, I would say, not excellent, but we were above average, I would say. And I think that is where this conclave will deliberate on the learnings where we can move from our above average to excellent. And, and that will be very important role that the ICMR DHR system is going to play for future pandemics, for future diseases, for disease elimination, and for disease prevention, and for also for newer technologies and newer treatments and their rollout examples being small examples being point of care test for sickle cell how we are going to roll it out when we communicate well when we communicate to well we will be having less difficulties example being a new salt for dc salt for lymphatic failure if we communicate well first the science has to be secure everything has to be certain safety has to be established efficacy has to be established new vaccines new treatments so communication in today's world which is on the edge in terms of mobile insta instagram whatsapp uh, and you know everyone is connected so we are really in the net of the internet that we all have to work within that net and once we are in that net, I think we need to utilize that net in every which way, that uh, whatever our endeavors are, reach the society, reach the masses, reach the underprivileged of our society, reach the tribal populations, and that will ensure that we see a much better, brighter future for India, and India as one of the most developed nations in the world which is the vision of our current leadership. And we are going in that direction. And I wish this meeting all success. And it's all about communication, communication, communication. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. COVID really has changed how we, I mean, how the public in general talks about health, medicine, and science. and. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, ICMR has led the way in actually bringing about that change and that shift. So we're very excited to be seeing more of it in the future. Next, uh, I would like to call up uh, Professor Dr. Paul. Uh, as everyone knows, Professor Dr. Paul is a leading strategist for health policy in India and a pediatrician by training, uh, and has been very well known for his contributions to the area uh, over the years. Um, Thank you. Dr. Paul will be talking about the keynote address. Yes, yes, two minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Namaste, Abhinandan. Respected Professor Balram Bhargav, DGI CMR, Secretary DHR. Respected Dr. Bang, Dr. Pandav, distinguished ICMR family, directors of all the institutes uh, of ICMR across the country, Anjali ji, and Team India. There is a panel to follow, so I'll answer the tough questions from Anjali at that time. But I want to just, in continuity of what Dr. Bhargav has said, want to add that what matters in the message are very few things. First, and that from COVID experience in particular, and also communication that we all have experienced in our own way, in our work, for mothers, children, adults, adolescents, mental health stakeholders, and so on. Firstly, the message has to be clear, unambiguous. 
lack of clarity has a lot of price to pay. One, that the message doesn't reach. But the other side is, which we face, there's a cost to the government. And, you know, you have to then face up to your leadership and say, oh my God, we could have done better. So there is that side. So have the message as much clear cut as possible, crystal clear. And it has two elements. One is what should be conveyed. What is it that you want to let be known? And the second is why. Now in today's time, why is very important. Everybody wants to know why are you saying this? Everybody. Everybody means just all the all the quintiles. And why has two dimensions. Very interestingly, why has two dimensions. One is how will it help me, my family, community, nation, and so on. But the other side of why is the science. People like to know what is the basis of what you are saying. Booster dose dena hai, kyunki aap pratirakshan ki kshamta aapki 6 mahine baad, 9 mahine baad kam ho jayegi. Ye sunna chahte hain log. Aur phir sunna ye bhi chahte hain ki 6 kyun aur 9 kyun agar usko aage jaye. So aaj ka message jo hai, wo sirf ye nahi TV se bachna hai, machhar kharaab hai. Ye wo purana zamana ho gaya. So the first element is very crystal clear message. And please help us Please help us to craft those messages. Help the policy makers, program managers. We are not, we need help. We try our own best through common sense. But then as I said, if there is ambiguity, there is a backlash. And then it comes on us and above all comes at times on certain levels of leadership. And that's not easy. So that's the first part. The second part is People want to have a feeling clearly, and all of us want to have a feeling that this communication is based on trust. This is the truth. Whatever you want to make, why, what you want to make, you want to understand. But one feeling is that this is trust. This communication is on the platform of trust, the truth. That is very important. And that is about, you can say, the art of this. I think the other one I want to call science, and this is the art. What well, trust comes with tone, tonality, presentation, articulation, imaging, colors, mood. So health communication is about truth. We are endeavoring to help people to, to have healthy behaviors or information which will promote health. We want them to be part and parcel of the participation of people for health or health activity of a particular nature, any of the nutrition, vaccine, anything, non-communicable disease, better habits, okay, or road traffic, uh, carelessness, shall we say. So it has to be based on trust. It has to be crystal clear. It must explain why this is the right thing to do and it must explain what will it do. What will it do to you and me in terms of better behavior, healthy behavior. So this is an extension of what Dr. Bhagav said, setting the stage for tough discussion and tough sessions to follow. But thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul, for those words. Uh, absolutely, knowledge is power, and it's very important to empower uh, the public around us with that kind of, uh, with the right information uh, to take the decisions that they should about their health. And communications is um, the basis of any uh, relationship and building trust, uh, including the relationship between public health services and systems and the public that uh, they serve. So thank you very much for reminding us about that. Now, let's begin with our agenda. I'd like to first call upon uh, Dr. Rajni Kant. Dr. Rajni Kant is a director at ICMR Regional Medical Research Center, Gorakhpur, and he is the head of the policy and commun communications at IC uh, ICMR headquarters. 
So would you please, may I request you to come on stage? Thank you so much. Dr. Rajni Kant, of course, as a lot of you know, has vast experience in biomedical research, health policy research, and strategic planning. In his early years as a scientist, he has done pioneering work in devising innovative ways to tackle malaria among the communities. But today, he will be speaking to us about um, the journey of the council, how it instituted its uh, communications ecosystem, and uh, take us through everything that they've done in the last few years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Indra. So it's a great day, and a historic day. And uh, our respected Secretary DHR, DGI Sima, Dr. Bhargav, Professor Paul, member Niti Ayog, Dr. Abhay Bang, Dr. Sanjay Mahendle, former additional DGI CMR, currently the director, Hinduja Hospital, Dr. Samiran Panda, our senior DDG administration, senior financial advisor, all colleagues, senior scientists, all the directors. We are so lucky that all the directors are here today. All the nodal communication officers, they are also here. And uh, many people from the different science agencies, CSIR, TST, DBT, and other international bodies, they are here. So it's a great day for all of us. So when we talk about the communication in the area of health research, we never thought about the health communication. We were doing research. But sometimes back we thought, yes, as Dr. Paul said today, Yes, communication is very, very important, and uh, COVID-19 realized the importance of health communication. What we did and where now we stand. So I am going to share the journey of the ICMR ecosystem in the area of health communication. So we know about the ICMR. ICMR we know is the apex body for the formulation, coordination, and the promotion of health research in the country. And if you see the logo of ICMR, it has a wise words of Charak, Pariksh Karano Hi Kushila Bhavanti, which means those alone are wise who act after investigation. So it means that evidence-based policy, whenever you can't say anything unless and until you have evidence. So we are following the wise words of Charak in the ICMR. But it was set up in 1911. It was known as the Indian Research Fund Association. Long before Gandhi became Mahatma and the Delhi became the capital of India. So that is the old historical importance of the Indian Council of Medical Research. It was set up in 1911 by Hartcourt Butler. He was the member department of uh, education, health and lands of the Viceroy Executive Council. And uh, Sir Pardi Lucas, he was the director general at that time of the Indian Medical Services. And uh, fortunately, Pardi Lucas, he was the first editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Research being brought out by the ICMR, and now we have the impact factor of five of the IGMR. So he was the first editor of the Indian Journal of Medical Research. So since 1911, ICMR has been working to improve the health and well-being of the country. So we have done tremendous work in the area of health research to strengthen the, our health system in the country and to find out the solution for different health issues. If you see the journey of 111 years, what ICMR has done, done excellent work in the area of uh, tuberculosis for validation of the dots, MDT for the leprosy, oral rehydration therapy for the cholera, intervention tools for various vector-borne diseases like lymphatic filariasis, like malaria, Kalajar, tackling viral outbreaks like Nipah, Zika, canine distemper virus, and recently the COVID-19, we played the important crucial role, breaking the myth of protein energy, malnutrition, and the various field-based studies, including clinical trials, in the area of maternal and child health, non-communicable disease, and many more, more. It's very difficult to describe ICMR achievement of the last 111 years. But despite of all these efforts, our research visibility to the outside world was very, very limited because we were not having a communication ecosystem in the ICMR. So that was the big lacunae. And it was felt need that we should improve our health communication. And there was a high power committee it was headed by Professor P. N. Tendon in 2012. And the research performance evaluation of the ICMR was done by Thomson Reuters, now known as the Clarivate Analytics, in 2016. And they realized there is a need to improve the visibility of the ICMR to the outside world, to the society, as well as to enhance the social connect and uh, improve the media interaction and the interinstitutional interagency connect. So in 2016, we realized, yes, there is a need. Then we started working to strengthen the communication in ICMR in 2017. 
So there were key challenges. There was communication was perceived as a peripheral and ad hoc function. So we currently have 27 ICMR institute, but only few, maybe one or two National Institute of Malaria Research, NIMR, and the National Institute of Nutrition, they were having some communication system, doing some IEC related activities, but not the ICMR Institute. They were having the communication as a major activity. And there was limited stakeholders, media and social media engagement was not up to the mark. As Dr. Bhargav said, below average or up to the average, not above average and excellent. So that, it was happening that time, five years back. And the lack of uniform brand identity and the protocols, there was no uniform brand and each of the institute, they were having their own brands. So there was no uniformity in the branding. So what we did, so we did that in 2017, we set up a unit of its own kind, communication unit at the ICMR headquarters. With a network of nodal communication officers, we identified in each and every institute the person who can communicate better. So we identified our scientists. They were not having the expertise in the area of communications, our own scientists. So they were uh, identified as a nodal communication officer. So each and every ICMR institute now, today, we have 27 nodal communication officers and all NCOs they are sitting today. So many other directors and the NCOs they are sitting today. So we identified these uh, NCOs and we developed a model on the hub and spoke systems in ICMR. So, and we started working what we did number one, disseminating ICMR research at the national and the regional level, we started doing this. And uh, facilitating the communication related trainings. So we started imparting trainings, having media interaction, crisis communication, we started engaging with the external stakeholders, and we started strengthening the ICMR digital and social media presence. So there was no ICMR presence on the social media. So we started giving training in the, in the area of social media. Managing risk communication, because many of time we struggled with outbreak, epidemics, natural disasters happening. So we started giving training in the area of risk communication. And uh, ICMR branding, so we developed the branding guidelines. ICMR should have a uniform branding. So we gave around 35, more than 35 training programs conducted in partnership with the CU and definitely the GHS were the, our partner, they were supporting in the training and over 200 scientists, they were trained in the area of health communication in the ICMR and the CU also conducted over 15 targeted training for the directors, so we trained to our directors also so that they can interact with the media and they can communicate better with the media. So we started giving training to the senior scientists and the directors, all the, of the ICMR directors, they were giving training in the area of health communication. And later on, we developed this regional communication hub. So we have divided all the ICMR Institute in three groups. So there is a Western hub, there's a Eastern hub, and a Southern hub. So each hub is being led by one of the ICMR Institute. For example, the Western hub is being led by the Nari Pune, Eastern hub is being led by the RMRC Bhuneshwar and the southern hub being led by the NIN. And under each and hub, each and each regional hub, there are five to seven institutes. So they are interacting and having interaction and dealing with the regional media. So that is how we have started working in the ICMR. And the rest of the institute, they are being governed by the communication unit at the headquarters. So the, the regional hubs, they are working efficiently and we are having regular meetings so that we can discuss the different issues. So what has been the impact of our communication unit? So we developed extensive media and the social media and disaster management policies and protocols in the ICMR. So for the first time in the 111 years history of the ICMR, we developed the media policy of the ICMR. Do's and don'ts, what ICMR should do, what they should not do, when they should go to the media, when they should not go to the media. So this media policy is ready right now. We developed the social media best practices document. This is also ready. And we prepared the disaster management plan so that we can tackle whenever there's any disaster outbreak epidemics are happening and we developed the branding guidelines. So now each and ICMR Institute, they have a uniform brand. The logo was ICMR change, and each and everything have a brand now. So these efforts, they were made to develop the protocol and policies. Then we started working on the collaterals document for path-breaking work of ICMR conducted during the last 111 years. So we came out with the Touching Life, the coffee table book, highlighting the 16 uh, landmark stories of the ICMR success. We came up with a special volume on the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi and held at 150. We reprinted this My Word of Preventive Medicine by Dr. C.G. Pandit. Dr. C.G. Pandit was the first director of the new ICMR that was created in 1949. So he, that is a biography, autobiography of C.G. Pandit. So recently we have reprinted this uh, book. 
Then we developed the history of history timeline of ICMR from 1930 to today. So this history timeline is displayed in the reception of the ICMR. Then we made some films, animation film, and different videos on different ICMR Institute activities and achievement. So these were the collaterals which were part of the communication activities. Then we started sharing our research findings with the public and the, with the media. And the, all the achievements of the ICMR, they were shared with the media. And they appeared in the popular magazines like the Week and the inter interacted with the media people. There was a media interaction. Press releases were there, interviews were there. Then many opinion editorials. We gave training how to write an opinion editorial. Many of the directors, they have shared the opinion editorial in the lead, leading newspapers. We also developed and started working in the community-based programs in the area of tuberculosis, malaria, leprosy, Kala Ajar, and I started working with the different departments, railways, so they can also help in the area of communication. And we also started working to improve the health literacy in the school children. So during the Gandhi and Health at 150, we prepared many of the new programs that can be useful for the students and uh, so that the student they can be trained for the healthy behavior so this was a very successful program and we did a pilot in the Delhi 36 schools this was also a part of the communication activities and now recently we have started the knowledge sharing workshop with the health journalist now many of the top health journalists they are visiting to different icmr institute so that they can gain the ground level information recently we conducted this workshop at nari pune and iv pune and the ICMR NIRT at VCRC Pondicherry. So a lot of news information is now appearing in the newspapers and the journalists. They are having opportunity to deal with the scientists and the directors and they can capture the ground level information from the ICMR Institute. So what has been the impact if you see this uh, bar diagram on the right side? The ICMR presence on the social media was almost negligible in 2017. Only 3,000 followers on Twitter and 2,000 on the Facebook. If you look and see the 2022 data, there are more than 3 lakh followers on the Twitter and more than 1 lakh followers on the Facebook. And each and every ICMR Institute now has a social media presence. They have a Twitter handle, they have a Facebook page. So that has been the impact of the ICMR communication in the area of health. And recently, now we are celebrating the 75 years of independence, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahasa, and we have carried out many activities, webinar, symposium, community engagement program, social media campaigns, so media interviews, regularly we are doing in the area of uh, India at 75, Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahasa. This is also the part of the communication. So during the COVID-19, we realized the importance of communication. This was very, very important. There was so much chaos misinformation, fake news. So what we did, so we were proactive while we were dealing with the COVID-19. So it was a prompt media communication. We developed a special page. Web page was created and this is still available on the ICMR website. So each kind of information is available on this web page, whether it is a testing facility, laboratory network, guidelines, protocols, information vaccine. And regularly we were updating on the social media, whatever was happening in ICMR institutes in NIV Pune, we were doing regular social media presence on the ICMR website as well as on the Twitter and the Facebook. So we were very active during the COVID-19. And our spokesperson, we identified a spokesperson in each and every institute from the headquarters, either DG ICMR or additional DG ICMR, at that time Dr. Ganga Khetkar, followed by Dr. Samiran Panda. So we were regularly interacting with the media, giving the right information at the right time. Many a time we also send the op opinion editorial in the newspaper so that the correct information was reaching to the masses. There should not be any chaos. Beside these uh, dealing with the media, we also developed the poster on the co-vaccine journey, journey of the co-vaccine. We developed a poster, we developed a COVID timeline. So each and everything which were happening in the COVID-19, we have developed a COVID-19 timeline. A co-vaccine wall has also been created. This is also been displayed at the ICMR headquarters. We developed the co-vaccine film on the co-vaccine, and uh, Dr. Bhargav has uh, written a book, Going Viral. And this uh, Going Viral book also describes the journey of the co-vaccine as well as the work done by the ICMR in the area of COVID-19. So this was again very fascinating done, work done by the ICMR. We have also brought out one document on the COVID-19 pandemic. This also enlists the activities of all the ICMR Institute, whatever work they have done in the area of COVID-19. We also started one uh, newsletter with the name e This is a bilingual newsletter in English and Hindi. 
and one special issue was the women warrior of icmr so there were many women scientists those who were leading the war for the covid 19 so a special issue has been come up and this is in high demand many of the journalists they ask the women warrior issue of the icmr so this issue is still we are coming, bringing out this issue e samvad so as dr paul was telling about the art and science of communication so this is very fascinating art and science so health communication how it can help it can help in the disease prevention it can help in the surveillance it can help in the disease elimination it can also encourage the health behavior that is we are going to talk a panel discussion on the behavior change communication it can also help in improving the vaccine hesitancy and ultimately it can improve the health outcomes it can also bridge the gap between the health research and the policy making and overall impact overall public health landscape so that is how the importance of health communication so what is the way forward so we are now thinking about taking it to a new level and we are now starting the health communication course so those who are interested in the area of health communication they can have the health communication course we have signed a mou with the G, with the mica and the ghs and today we are going to start this course and uh, a program on the internship program for the journalists those who are interested in the health communication so new journalists they can go to the any of the icmr institute they can get information and get training in the area of health communication and now we are starting a extra mural funding in the area of health communication so those who are interested to do research in the health communication there will be a separate separate uh, subject in the area of health communication so that they can do research also so these are the new things which we are thinking and uh, very shortly we are going to start and as we all know today icmr is a household name because of the impact of the health communication and einstein once said if you cannot explain it simply it means you don't understand it well enough so that is how the how your complicated science can be transformed into a simple sentences so that the people can understand and people can understand you so we are committed to strengthen india science communication ecosystem in new direction to ensure better health outcome for every indian thank you so much Thank you so much uh, Dr Rajnikanth I'd like to request you to please wait and uh, perhaps uh, uh, our colleague Kaushik, Kaushik Bose uh, could felicitate him Thank you sir for your contributions and uh, it is a, you know the success of your endeavors Thank you can we have some applause thank you it is evident uh, to to the the extent uh, to which icmr has become a household name and that twitter handle and your uh, regular updates were a lifeline for so many people during the pandemic so thank you to all of you uh, moving forward we're going to start with our first uh, um, well inviting our uh, the panelists for our first uh, panel discussion up on stage um I'd like to once again uh, invite before that of course we will be proceeding uh, this the panel discussion with the unveiling of some of ICMR's uh, new reports and products uh, so I'd like to request uh, uh, professor uh, Dr Balram Bhargav up on stage once again please uh, professor Dr Paul may we have you up on stage as well please and of course uh, anjali nayar uh, executive vice president of global health strategies and uh, one of our leading global experts in public health uh, advocacy communications and uh, uh, you know with a two decade for this as well anjali we'd have to have you up on stage <laughs> a leading public health expert with over two decades of uh, experience in building uh, some of the biggest campaigns not just in india but globally um anjali has uh, led so many efforts on the most pressing health and development issues uh, of our times and constantly pushes all of us that know her to do so much better than we do yeah 
So now may I request uh, Dr. Rajni Kant uh, as well as uh, Dr. Ina Dobra Gupta to please uh, felicitate our, uh, our dignitaries. Please go ahead. So, okay. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, with Miss Anjali Nair. Some applause, please. Thank you. Next, Professor Dr. V.K. Paul. <laughs> and finally, Professor Dr. Balram Bhargava, please. Now, over the last few years, the ICMR has worked round the clock on several initiatives. And uh, today, with, in this August gathering and with our uh, dignitaries, uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to al allow us to launch some of the work that showcases the impact of the Council's immense contribution to public health. Yeah. So let us begin by unveiling um, on the eve of India's 75th uh, year of independence, ICMR and GHS uh, will be unveiling a photo book titled Changing the Nation's Health Landscape, which narrates 75 remarkable stories where ICMR has changed the public health discourse of these countries. These stories are narrated through impactful visuals which document the journey of ICMR through the left, last 75 years. Next, we present a, co a compilation of ICMR and its 27 institutes' contributions during COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. This report captures the Council's commitment towards fighting against the global pandemic and its scientific rigor towards combating a deadly disease which has left an imprint on each of us. Thank you. Now, almost a year ago, Professor Bhargava authored a book on the journey of making India's first indigenous COVID-19 vaccine, Covaxin, entitled, uh, as some of you and a lot of you have probably already seen, Going Viral. This engaging story needs to reach every Indian, and for that very purpose, the previously in our English edition is now available in Hindi, and uh, we are very happy to launch the Hindi edition of this book today. Next, we take a look into the future endeavors of ICMR in taking communications to new heights. We're happy to announce that ICMR is soon going to launch a health communications course, as Dr. Rajni Khan said, in collaboration with MICA and Ahmedabad, a premier management and communications institute, and global health strategies. 
This one-of-its-kind course will help public health experts and scientists become better communicators and in turn improve health outcomes in this country. We're also launching a health communications internship program that will build the next generation of health communicators for the country. This program will be instrumental in ensuring the Council's critical public health research reaches a much wider audience. Now, I'll give everyone some time. Last but not least, in line with ICMR and its institutes endeavor to rebrand themselves, ICMR National Institute of Virology, NIV in Pune, has a new website. The new website will make scientific information easily accessible to the public. <laughs> Big congratulations to ICMR. These are Land, landmark milestones in their history and uh, thank you for the relentless work over the last few years and all the best to the council for their journey ahead. Now we can go forward with uh, the first panel of the day. This discussion will be moderated by Ms. Nair. So for the first panel, the title is The Power of Communications, Health Policies from Desks to Households. Over to you, Anjali. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Indira. And um, thank you so much uh, for being here uh, for this first panel. And I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Balram Bhargav and Dr. V.K. Paul, two people that I've worked with and admired from a distance for a very long time. This is, um, it's really an amazing moment uh, for uh, someone uh, who's been a demographer and recognized very early that data has to be shared, data has to be communicated. And to see our premier institute uh, doing so much on ensuring transparency in communication is a moment for every proud Indian. So with that, um, the questions are not going to be difficult, uh, <laughs> Dr. Paul. And in any case, you have a lot of experience fielding difficult questions. But I think I want to start by saying that the two, everyone knows the two of you. But what I do want to add is uh, Dr. Paul has been the head of uh, the pediatrics department in Ames, and you've been a leading cardiologist. And apart from just being professors and medical experts, they have done so much in the field of research. There's a uh, study that's uh, been put out which talks about you as one of the 2% top scientists in pediatrics, and you have developed amazing devices to uh, prevent sudden heart attacks. So it's been not just leading uh, a department, which has to be very, very difficult and uh, time consuming. There's so much else, so much research and contribution that they've made. I'm going to ask one question to the two of you and then specific questions to each of you. And my first question is, the pandemic has quite easily been one of the most challenging time in everyone's life. And the two of you were at, really, at the helm of it all. With the way the information was coming in, almost on a daily basis, 
Can you share just a couple of episodes on how you communicated? Because you could communicate one data point, and a week later it was changed, or a day later it was changed. So maybe if you can share just a couple of incidents, uh, how you managed such a difficult time and communicating so much information. Thank you, Anjali. I think uh, before I start, I would say one thing which is common between the two of us is, you said it, but let me make it obvious, we are clinicians. We are dealing with conversations with, our fam with the patient, the family. So I guess that has been an, a vintage point. We don't have to, unlike the journalists, they have to learn. For us, it was intuitive in that sense, and I think that must have helped. The point that you're making uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, of changing information, is actually very valid, because we were dealing with a disease which did not exist before December 2019. It wasn't there. And we didn't know how to deal with it, we didn't understand the virus, and so on. So one quick point that comes to our mind, and that where the, those principles that I enunciated helped is the following. In the earliest phase of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, in the National Task Force, led by the two of us, we consulted a very eminent group, and they said, way forward is hydroxychloroquine. And we had, from the, from the uh, Harrison's book chapter or section, Everything was falling in line. There was a biological plausibility and so on, and we, we were clear in our mind as a group that that is a way forward. And we communicated that. This became part of the national protocol. And when we had to drop it, we stated the fact that we started with that as a knowledge point, but then with increasing data, information, studies, the truth seems to be different as it stands on that day. Science is a journey for truth. Sometimes we are at this point, sometimes here. I'm not sure whether we ever reach the real truth. So we, I think we're, we were, we honestly stated and communicated to the people that no more HCQ should be on the chart of treatment. And uh, I think people of India accepted. Uh, we had the same story with ivermectin. Uh, we, didn't accept it in the beginning. Somewhere in the middle, we thought there was evidence and we discussed this, and then it was dropped. And it has been dropped. So yes, instances came when such an approach was needed. And I'll tell you another instance now, that's actually more interesting. By mistake, a couple of individuals in UP got the different vaccine in the very early course of vaccine uh, implementation. So co-vaccine, Wallace got the other one, uh, Covishield and Covishield got the other one. At that time, there was already a little bit of a literature which said that if a different vaccine is given, it actually might be better. Might be, just, just a little you know, whiff of knowledge floating around. Uh, so we were faced with this question and you know, it was like a big thing. And then from our heart, we, believed in what we said. We said it might actually not be such a bad thing and there's nothing to worry. Uh, so we, both of us were in that press uh, uh, briefing, uh, got away, uh, people accepted, and it I think helped calming uh, the, the people. So it goes back to the same thing. The, the, the tone of sincerity and trust and what you believe in inside you is if you, what, if you convey that belief outside, I think people accept. Now, I think this is a very important question from my perspective. I think Dr. Paul has already talked about how we worked as a team and we would talk the same thing. That was the most important point. But um, to be very frank with you, myself, I'm a cardiologist and I had to do epidemiology, communicable diseases, and now this virus, Nipah, Zika, and then this COVID-19. And multiple. 
I am monkeypox and, and I am kind of <laughs> thrown, thrown into the sea that learned to swim. Now, how am I learned to swim? I have not communicated, I have never, I mean, yes, with patients, patients relative, in your territory, it is fine. But when you are in, in someone else's territory, when you are talking to the press on the television, it's not your territory. And, and that's where you have to kind of, uh, so I had to prepare. I'm being very frank, I had to prepare. I used to prepare at 3.15 for the 4.4.30, uh, 3.3.15 for the 4.4.30 uh, media briefing every Thursday, Tuesdays. And I, had, I would take down points with my colleagues. Um, uh, now the advantage that this 111 year old organization has, you just pick up the phone and you talk to a specialist on leprosy, you pick up the phone, you sp speak to a, a, a specialist on nutrition, you pick up the phone, you talk to a virologist, and, and you get the latest on what is going on, or you tell them and then they come back with a top four or five succinct points. And I think that is exactly what uh, you mentioned, that it has to be very small. The communication, whatever you have to talk, has to be very succinct, what you want to communicate. You can keep wrapping around and taping, but once you talk s briefly, then it works very, very well. And from my perspective, I had to prepare, write down. Uh, initially, there was Dr. Ganga Khetkar who was there. Then there was Dr. Samiran Panda there. Uh, 3, 3.15, I used to just request him, what are we going to, what do we feel? Uh, we used to argue uh, at that point in time before speaking. I used to ring up uh, Priya or ring up uh, Pragya or uh, uh, talk to Nivedita and tell her, Ki, bhai, ye bolna hai, nahi bolna hai. So that was the tough part getting the right message across. I mean, the National Task Force was, yes, a support and a sheet anchor for all of us, that 40, 50 experts from the country have said something, but we were the face. Exactly. We were the face and we had to face the bullets. Fortunately, fortunately, because this organization had some, a huge credibility, and the first case was diagnosed by ICMR, NIV, then the testing was scaled up, then we were working on the vaccine, there was a sense of credibility in the population at large. And, and they would listen to what we were saying. Because, as Dr. Panda always says, don't speak more than you are asked. And you need to be very brief. <laughs> he always says, you have to be brief. And I, I, I firmly believe that brevity is the soul of it. And you have to be brief and to the point and precise. And those were some of the learnings which I will do your course when you start with, uh, 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 again. I think you could teach it now, <laughs> you could but, but, teach uh, it now. But, but, but these are some of the points which are very important, mm -hmm. because uh, we are talking, we are not in our ivory tower, we are not in our armchair, uh, in our blue sky zone, and as a scientific, talking at the messenger RNA level and talk. We have to talk to the common to man. The common and so we have to really come down to their level in terms of their understanding and their uh, put yourself in their shoes, what is their worry, and then try to address that. And that, we did falter once in a while, yes, but uh, we were caught uh, unawares once in a while, but by and large, there was a, as Dr. Paul has said, there was a level of trust and uh, patience in the people as well. It was certainly a period of trial by fire. I mean, that I don't think any other saying can be true. But there's one question, you know, from there, which really will be very important to most communicators. There were moments of sheer panic in the public, and uh, everyone was struggling, because as you said, it was a new virus, no one knew. There was, there was no vaccine available at that time. There was no clear course of medication. So both of you have had experience in dealing with anxiety in patients, in dealing with anxieties of families of patients. Do you think that prepared you? How did you stay calm in the face of this diversity? Because you were calm on television. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think uh, that's a, 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 a very, I mean, one of the tough ones to field. But uh, the, what helped me was, uh, personally was uh, being an interventional cardiologist, dealing with life and death in a matter of seconds, giving a DC shock, not giving a shock, uh, blowing up the balloon, throwing, I mean, those kind of things really personally helped me clearly. And uh, the role that we had to play, and as physicians that we have had to play 
is to reassure and reassure right from day one, right from when I graduated in 1984. Since then you have to reassure the patient, the patient relatives, how to break bad news. There is, we know the five phases of breaking bad news. There's denial, there's aggression, there is bargaining, then there's depression and final, finally acceptance of a bad news. So taking all those learnings into account, it, if we were uh, not patient, I don't think we can communicate. So that was the, the bottom line, I think. To me, in continuity, <clears throat> I think, again, personally, what helped me is the fact that, you know, as a clinician, we are trained to, or we are intuitively, we deal with empathy. We convey empathy, we feel empathy, we practice empathy. So we could relate to, you know, the difficult times, we could relate to them as citizens, as, you know, as players or actors on the, on the, on the national scene. So it's an extension of what Dr. Bhargav said. That helped because when we would say that we, 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 we feel what the people's uh, problems were and we could empathize. So I think that perhaps was coming across. Uh, but the second part is that uh, being in the chairs that we occupied, we had to do two other things. A, to give hope. Yes. To, to, to say that we have a plan. Yes. We will work. Uh, we are there to find solutions to the best of our abilities. This is not the end. Yes. We will do this. We will do this. Come back to you in one week. Come back to you in three days time tomorrow. One month time, vaccine may come. We'll identify the virus, we'll do so. So hope. And the third one, embedded in that, is the national pride. Hum kaise isko out of control honne deenge? Ye to desh ka mamla hai. Desh sambhalega, desh ladega, desh jitega. So I think it was a mixture of these feelings or these strands that went behind uh, to tackle those situations uh, in front of the public. Thank you. Thank you. But Anjali, I just want to add. Yes. But the the confidence and the, the that which our leadership had placed on not only us but on the people working together as a whole of government approach was also really giving us the confidence to to this. to, to uh, be able to communicate with uh, with confidence. So yeah. that helped tremendously, I think. Yes. I and I have to really uh, congratulate uh, both of you because that's one thing that I never saw. I watched very, I mean, I watched all your interviews and your shows regularly. I never saw the panic coming through. I always saw reassurance. So I think your patients were also very lucky. But uh, Professor Dr. Bhargava, I want to ask you, what made you think about writing the book Going Viral? And um, what, I mean, it talks about the journey of the vaccine, and the vaccine has been absolutely critical in bringing down uh, death and hospitalization for COVID-19. What do you think you want, I mean, what would you, what did you want to convey about the journey, role of ICMR and the vaccines? And I would encourage everyone to read that book. I've read it, and it's immensely readable. Why I wrote the book, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you, we, this is somewhere around the very beginning of the pandemic and we are, Dr. Paul, myself and Randeep, we are there at the, in our ICMR office and discussing what we are going to tell the cabinet secretary. And, and we're just framing things on paper, two, one white paper with two lines which is mentioned in that book about how we communicated that two things, that international travel should stop and we must impose a sort of a restriction in the society to build up our infrastructure, two lines. And when we presented it to this leadership and they said tremendous clarity on one white big piece of paper, just two lines written, I said that's our, our consensus view and that's, and, and that when we were sitting, I told Dr. Paul that all these things that we are scribbling I'm putting in this little cardboard box here, where, 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 which were, uh, and, and he said, are you not 
throwing those papers. I said, no, they are being kept. They are being kept for me to find some time to be able to write a book and to express this because uh, this moment is not going to arise. We don't know where, in which direction we are going to. Are we going to win? Are we going to lose? Are we going to make it? Um, but let us keep this for, uh, for, if possible, for posterity with the purpose to glorify science, to glorify healthcare, and to glorify the work that is being done by our excellent scientists, which, uh, which is not showcased to the society um, at all. Because the kind of work they do in their laboratory, they, I mean, under the hood with the negative pressure of facing that virus, working in, in a maximum containment facility, working in a BSL, people don't know that. People are not aware that this virus could infect that person who's working on it. And they're waging war with that virus every day, on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to grow it. It's growing there, but it can grow in you also. So, so those are the things which were, which probably had to be glorified. We have been having, we've had some success in this book, been able to tell the story, but I think lots more has to be communicated. Has to be. Lots more has yes, to be. absolutely. It's one of the most, um, I mean, it's a, it's a time in our lives which has taught every, each one of us so many things. Uh, Dr. Paul, you've always been an excellent communicator. And I've seen you in a room full of um, activist NGOs talking against childhood vaccines, and you calm them down in 10 minutes of talking to them. But this has been, as you mentioned, it's, it's been a very tough time. In your learnings, what are the three no's? What are the three things a communicator must never do? Let me try. Thank you. Mm. You didn't ask me why I didn't write the book. <laughs> <laughs> and why you asked me why you wrote well, the book. Well, I'm hoping for your book now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a slow writer. OK, three things which the communicator should not do. I think it should stem from some conversation that I did earlier. Uh, and well, I also prepared in my own way, more like concentrating and thinking what would come and you know, just calm myself down. I would do that. Let me share that personally. Hmm. I would shut down everything three o'clock and just be myself. They, my staff knows. Uh, so again, so you should be prepared when you're going into public. We should, should be prepared. You should anticipate as you heard from Dr. Bhargav, in your own way, you do it differently. So you should not be unprepared. You should not take it non-seriously. Don't trivialize this. Um, because even in a small circle, if communication is happening, you are expected, you are expecting them to align to, a, to something different that you want them to do. I write in the most popular textbook, and I told my co-authors, Look, you're sh just not writing anything. You're shaping the minds of tomorrow's medical students, tomorrow's doctors who are medical students today. So you keep in mind the larger purpose that is meant. So be, don't go unprepared. Number two, we, what we should not do is to uh, give an answer about which you think you are not, you, you don't have the data or information, and I faltered on that a couple of times. It is taken in a different way. Uh, so it's best, better to use the principle of brevity or not to speak, uh, but rather than you know share something which is half-baked, uh, which will go as a non, like a message which is really not a crystal clear message. And the third thing is really uh, not to put down anybody who's asking a question. I would perhaps never do it. I would never do it. Be prepared. If your, your God-given duty is to be on the other side on that day, particularly on behalf of the government, particularly on behalf of science, particularly behalf of, on behalf of the profession, please respect the person who has come to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got about seven minutes, and so questions are for the two most eminent persons in the field of health research. Yes, sir. Uh, could you state your name and 
Dr. Chandrakant Pandav. Okay. Uh, I was at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. I spent 45 continuous years there. Yes, My question to both of you is there is one tribe that was conspicuously missing in this entire show, the public health experts. If you look at the profile of the people who occupied the television space, I want to understand from you, since COVID-19 is a public health issue, why were the epidemiologists, public health experts, behavioral scientists, and management experts missing in this conversation? Let me try. <coughs> Dr. Panda, you're talking about people whom you were seeing in front. But the information that, and they represent the government. The information and the guidance that comes from, comes from scientists, comes from behavioral scientists, it comes from people and institutions that represent those disciplines. So what is on the face of it is not the total picture. Please appreciate that. And I know this criticism. It so happened that before pandemic, some of us, happened to be there somewhere. And we were called upon to do our duty. But behind us, all of you, behind Dr. Bhargav, it is entire ICMR, if not more. And in that NTF that has been referred to, there are those experts that in that limited sabha mein jitne ho sakte hain. So yeh criticism thik nahi hai. Jab government looks at data, looks at information, you have NCDs, you have and CDC you have. So DGHS system is there. Inputs are coming from academia. Inputs are, you think we are not holding meetings with different people. Are we holding meetings with academia, with scientists, with industry, with epidemiologists, behavioral science. It all comes together. So don't look at what the face is. Look at what behind us was, in a way, the entire might of the people, the scientists, all stakeholders. And we reached out to them, and we tried to do the best job as we could do to channelize the collective wisdom of the nation. That's the way I like to see. Most humbly, sir. Yes, absolutely right. Do you want to? Thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Yes, sir. Please, your name and affiliation. Yes, we can. Vector Control Research Center at Puducherry. This question I had posed earlier as well, but this may not be directly related with communication. Could you speak a little louder, sir, and hold the mic close to you? Okay, so. Much uh, better. Now it's better. So, uh, my question to honorable sirs is that we have this virus and many of its uh, strains stored in many of refrigerators throughout the country. And do we have a policy to systematically destroy this virus so that this cannot be let loose or unleashed by any unscrupulous element any time in future? Thank you. Yeah, I think there are clear policies laid down by ICMR. And they are, from time to time, updated and changed as well. And uh, the, all the viruses that are stored, if you know that the the, the polio viruses are all stored in the maximum containment facility in uh, Pune. The smallpox and uh, virus has been destroyed in India, and whatever was there has been only, only available in Moscow and in Washington, two places that is there are the smallpox virus. Uh, for uh, polio surveillance, we regularly collect, and if we are able to find any virus or any variant, we again go to the repository and store that. For, uh, for this virus, we, are, we have uh, all the variants and are stored, but we have clearly given instructions that it has to be disposed of by the, uh, the, the private clinics as well as other agencies accordingly, according to the guidelines that have been given by ICMR. And there are clear guidelines on our website also. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, of course, Dr. Mendley. Uh, 
गॉड फॉर डॉक्टर मेहंदे एडिशनल डी जी आई सी एम आर रिटायर्ड माई क्वेश्चन टू बोथ ऑफ यू सर इज गॉड फॉर बिट दिस डजेंट हैपन बट इफ एट ऑल कोविड लाइक सिचुएशन हैपन्स अगेन वॉट काइंड ऑफ प्लैनिंग वी हैव डन एट द नैशनल लेवल डॉक्टर पॉल एंड एट द आई सी एम आर लेवल डॉक्टर भार्गवा टू सी टू इट दैट आवर रिस्पॉन्स विल बी मच मोर एफिशियंट एंड मोर इफेक्टिव एंड फोकसिंग पर्टिक्युलरली ऑन कम्युनिकेशन yeah i think uh, this covid has really taught us with this uh, with this momentum we have uh, created a large infrastructure and we are expanding that infrastructure we have created more human resources we are expanding that human resources we have created trainings for this human resources and we are expanding those trainings at every level and in fact today also at the icmr headquarters there was training going on of a quality assurance and other things at the VRDLs so that so those are the three things in terms of infrastructure human resources and training we are building up yes we we did get some time to build our health resources and health infrastructure during this pandemic and uh, the government is committed to make more medical colleges make more district hospitals better as well as the all india institutes across uh, different parts of the country but i think uh, still a lot needs to be done and more importantly the we need to work in cohesion more importantly we have to work as a team and the bottom line of that uh what you have hit the nail on the head is communication communication and the ownership of the people once the community at large is able to give sensors and communicate that these are the issues happening then we will be able to change our course and strengthen it further the the positive part is that uh, finances is not been an issue in building this infrastructure in the human resources and the training and from that perspective we have to provide uh, i always say some sort of a leadership in the region for example today only Uh, we have uh, supplied the reagents and training to eight countries in the southeast asia region today for monkey pox uh, so 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 those are the kind of things that we have to proactively take in terms of leadership and once we have the leadership uh, all the, the the communities work together not as a as a community not as a city not as a nation but as a, a region as a whole working working together fighting the next pandemic Just to add to that, you see, there is an unknown, unknown dimension uh, where you don't know things, right? अगर आप उसको हटा दें और इसी pandemic की extension को या इसी को नजर में रखते हुए totally unknown is an unknown thing. We don't know, right? लेकिन उसी को आगे लेके जाते हैं तो टू और थ्री थिंग्स कैन ऑल्सो फर्दर बी एडेड टू वट डॉक्टर भार्गव सेड वन इज दैट आर केपेबिलिटीज फॉर वैक्सीन आर नाउ यू नो विद एम आर एन ए वैक्सीन बींग रेडी आई थिंक दैट्स अ यू से प्रिपरेशन फॉर दिस काइंड ऑफ अ कलेमिटी यू हैव एन एम आर एन ए प्लेटफॉर्म विच इज थर्मोस्टेबल विच कैन बी स्विच फॉर सम ऑफ दिस काइंड ऑफ एजेंट्स and soon it will be also intradermal by the way you have intranasal vaccine capability so the science capabilities are at a different level in terms of your, today you don't need that mrna vaccine quote and quote right there is no market so that's why we uska to laga diya hai lekin future ke liye ek definite space aa gaya hai aap uh, intranasal vaccine mrna vaccine so these are your capabilities as an example and the speed with which you can do the regulatory mechanisms and the, the ability to work together the 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 readiness and the heightened readiness of institutions such as nib or thsti for that matter and others so that's one asset the second asset is uh, also the preparedness of the states because ultimately the states are have to face it they are they are out there to fight the battle so the level of preparedness for the state in terms of experience in terms of the surveillance system etc etc is at a much much different level there is a again third point the heightened focus 
on one health issues. Everybody is talking about it. We are bringing together the science agencies and ministries and silos are being broken to have a clear focus on one health linked to climate change. So there is positioning of the nation uh, backed by, I would say, hopefully very clear deliverables in the past. So there is a level of preparedness, which is from this level moved to another level. And um, uh, definitely like an animalistic response to, to, uh, to infection, right? The second time when you get infection, you have much better response. We, I think this is what would happen, like it happens in vaccines. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think we had a bell <laughs> ring as well. Uh, but truly appreciate your honest and frank answers. And I have to say that I, after uh, the first time after the pandemic, I went to our um, headquarters in New York. And I came back promising myself I'm never going to complain again. I think we did do a much better job than some of the first world countries. So. Thank you both for steering the country through this, and thank you for being in this discussion. Thank you so much, everyone, and thank you, Anjali, for facilitating this uh, candid conversation. We'll now move on to the next session. Our next session will be the communications playbook, Messaging for Millions, where we're going to hear about innovative ways to demystify health and science for all. And uh, thank you also from the last session, here, here to the glory of science. Uh, I'd like to call upon our panelists uh, to please join us uh, up on this stage. Uh, Dr. Ranjana Agarwal, who is the director of the CSIR, National Institute of Science Communication and Policy Research. Dr. Agarwal is a highly accomplished scientist and an active believer of using communications to bridge the gap between science and policy. A person after my own. Dr. Samiran Panda, of whom we had some very interesting anecdotes, uh, who until very recently was the additional director general at ICMR and is a leader in the field of HIV prevention and care in South Asia. Dr. Nakul Parasha, who serves as, as the director of Vigyan Prasad, an institution focused on enabling access to appropriate scientific information. And this session will be moderated by Dr. Subra, who serves as a scientist at ICMR, National Institute of Nutrition in Hyderabad, and has extensively worked in the area of health communications as well. May I please invite Dr. Enna Dogra Gupta and Dr. Priya Gaur from the communications unit to please felicitate them. Okay, first, uh, Dr. Subara. Dr. Panda. Next, Dr. Parasha. And finally, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you very much. And now over to you, Dr. Subarao. Oh, very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you. And uh, I have a stellar panel here. And uh, very easy stuff, not like a difficult questions that the earlier <laughs> panel had. Uh, and uh, yeah, before we start, I would just like to take a quick poll. We were discussing about communication being an art or a science. Uh, how many of you believe that it's a science? Very few, that's very few. How many of you believe it's an art? All. 
so let's see at the end of this if there's any change in the perception on communication and science communication. But before we start, uh, I think uh, the ancient Indian dictum says science, uh, a lot of things about science. Aneka samshaya chedi, which means it has to dispel a lot of myths and a lot of uh, you know false nomers, misnomers among people. And uh, parokshartham darshayat, which means it has to show what is obviously seen, show the beyond. And it also like, uh, uh, it, it is sarvasya loka sandarshita, which means it gives more eyes beyond uh, to see. And also it is like the one who doesn't have all the signs with them is almost like a blind person. But we as scientists, as Stephen Hawking has already said, you know, also have the duty of passing on what we learned to the people in a way they understand. But oftentimes communication is misunderstood and we think it has taken place. Somebody said, you know, I think Walt Disney, he said, uh, we are thinking we are educating people, ultimately we are leaving them entertained. So if you are, uh, actually our communication is leaving them entertained. So in this context, I think this session has been deliberately, uh, you know, uh, uh, scheduled in such a way that we try and see if there is any playbook for messaging to millions. If at all there is any, we'll see and what are the, what are the rules of such a playbook. Uh, uh, first question to you, ma'am, uh, Dr. Agarwal. You lead uh, the science communication and policy research organization of CSIR. And uh, what has been your experience and then what are the kinds of media and messaging that you use? And also, most importantly, to deal with the policy makers. You know, communicating to the policy makers is a different issue altogether. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Balram Bhagwa for the kind invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and sharing my views. As you said, uh, National Institute of Science Communication and Policy Research, uh, where I come from, this is one of the CSIR laboratory, uh, which is very unique in the sense because it connects science with the society. And we are the premier institution of India, which started communication science much before independence. So we have our roots in 1942, uh, when this public information uh, division was created in CSIR. So you can imagine uh, the expectations from NISPER is very high when it comes to science communication. As you said, uh, whether this science communication is science or art, and most of the people said it's art, but art without knowing science is not going to work. It's very important that when we do science communication, it is an art, but it's an art of communicating science. So we must know science, only then we can do the art with it. Otherwise, it will be body without soul. So, atma zaruri hai, tabhi wo communication jo hum karenge, wo effective ho paega. So, my institution uh, has the legacy to communicate science to different stakeholders of the society. At one end, we do scholarly scientific communication in the form of scholarly research journals, but at the same time, we serve to the masses. And as said, it's an art. So you need different art to communicating science to different sections. Yeah, the language is very important. If I don't understand English and you are Speaking chaste English with the good grammars and the adjective, it's not going to work with me. So you know that communication in the language which we understand is very important. So for us, the spectrum is very wide. We have our scholarly journal, but at the same time, through popular science magazines, through outreach programs, through audiovisuals, you know, th through different modes we communicate with different parts of the society. And uh, uh, this COVID game was, as Dr. Bhagwa mentioned, as Dr. Pal mentioned, was a very different game because when it came, nobody knew how to communicate, what to communicate. We didn't want to uh, further feed misinformation, disinformation. So as a very responsible institution, we have to take the right stand. We will park the COVID debate for later. Right. Thank you very much. And it's, uh, it's very enlightening uh, to also know that there was an organization that was looking at communication and science communication much prior to the independence of the country. Uh, but, uh, you know, what have been the media and methods that you've used uh, to reach out to 
the uh, you know grassroots right so as i said uh, we have 18 scholarly journals so for that we do the uh, yeah. scientific communication but we have three very uh, popular science magazines like science reporter and vigyan pragati which is celebrating 70 years of its completion and uh, science ki dunya this is that's in urdu so these are very popular science magazines uh, through those magazines we can communicate with the society similarly we have jigyasa programs through which we communicate with the school students uh, similarly we, uh, uh, we have camp program national knowledge awareness mapping platform through that we communicate with the school students uh, we also communicate with the uh, you know rural uh, sectors how we can create rural livelihood uh, by using csir technologies so through different modes and medias uh, our social media because now this is the time of you know digital communication electronic communications so through various modes using digital media social media we communicate science to the society thank you uh, dr panda my question will be next to you um, in your earlier avatar you've been a clinician there are a lot, lot of discussion about clinicians being communicators in their own territory and you've got a uh, little beyond that and then have uh, you know dealt with a very very sensitive topic and then mobilized communities in hiv aids and uh, things related to that and again uh, the covid uh, had seen you uh, seen much of you and the better of you in the social media media and everywhere what has been your magic sauce of uh, communication uh, you know the clinicians were as sir said the clinicians are good in their own territory uh, and the doctors often see the patients. When did you start talking to the patients and talking with the patients? Well, uh, you did refer to uh, a time uh, which for me started um, way back in 1991 or so, early 90s, HIV AIDS. And uh, uh, what is the magic sauce? That was your question. And uh, I, I, I was thinking the moment you use the term and um, I was thinking how did I learn what to speak and how to so we are using the phrase science communication if we add one more word science of communication or science behind communication professor Bhargav was sharing breaking bad news and then he clearly articulated five steps that's the science of communication in a particular context so there is a science behind communication which might not be appreciated uh, the moment we start talking um, about communication, but where the science ends, then the art begins. So th there is no either or dichotomy. That's, yeah. that's my first response. And then how did I learn or what did I do and how, how, how could I do what I did? Rests with my friendship uh, with people who had the problem and who are living with the problem. So it's whatever I have learned, I will give you, because none tell a story than stories. So I would rather share a story. I mean, I was in Manipur and uh, it was all about injection drug users and um, uh, related HIV. So we saw that there were beautiful posters done and they are dumped in one of the, you know, Manipur State AIDS Control Society, Nagaland State AIDS Control Society. Those are dumped posters with beautiful messages, what to do, what not to do. It's all about HIV AIDS. And I said, well, these are really costly ones, you know, the glossy papers with the pictures and all. Why are they not being used? And then we did a small experiment uh, with my friends, some ex-drug users, some current drug users, and we showed that posters, which had a skull and bones and some messages. What would happen if you do drug use or unsafe sex and then HIV AIDS? So it was shown, and after 15 seconds or so, or 20 seconds, because it was good enough time to have a look at the uh, picture, and then we had some discussion and came back to the content of the poster. Uh, what did the people remember? None of them had remembered any of the messages which were there. So we thought that we did fantastic, I mean, we meaning those who were, uh, you know, with the responsibility of developing that poster, but that told us very clearly that using a panic doesn't help in messaging. So that's the science of communication. So none of the messages went in. And then while everybody was talking about uh, drug use, 
drug users uh, or ex-drug users from Ukrul. That's a fantastic district, a beautiful place. There's a special lily which uh, blooms there called Siroi lily, but that's a different story altogether. And we realized that it's not just the drug, but the drug-sex interface. However, there was religious groups who were opposed to the whole idea of talking about sex or condom use. And I learned my lesson from one of my friends. They said, Dr. Panda, how to convey the message about condom use. You say, don't say yes to condom. I got shocked. OK, we have to talk about the condom. And that man is suggesting me, don't say yes to condom. Don't say no to condom. Just tolerate it if somebody is promoting it. And that was so acceptable to the religious leaders, because in religion, tolerance is the first thing. So I realized, wow. That's what it is. So magic sauce was to listen to the community, to be with them, and to learn from them. Because uh, the, the great uh, 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 the adage, or the phrase, by which we are guided is nothing about us without us. Yes. So that was the key. Whatever we did, we did try to do from ICMR. I was heading the ICMR unit um, for research on HIV AIDS in the northeastern states of India. So we always believed that nothing about the community without the community involvement. So communication should be intimately associated or linked or paired with another C, which is community. So the know your audience is the mantra that we are absolutely. taught when we are resonating with your audience. Yes, yes. absolutely. Uh, Dr. Nakul Parashar, I think you lead one of the premier organizations of DST, which is uh, you know, given the task of uh, taking signs to the people, Vigyan Prasar, and then uh, in your endeavor you do many things, and, and we've been part of a lot of those, you know, journalist awareness programs and community awareness programs and things like that. Uh, what has been uh, your experience uh, taking signs to the youth of the nation, the youngsters of the nation? Uh, it's been a very uh, enriching and a very interesting uh, experience while taking uh, science to the youth particularly. And uh, what I see is that everybody is willing, uh, everybody is willing to, you know, talk to you, communicate with you. The only problem with all of us is that we are not uh, willing to, we have reservations when it comes to that. I remember what I studied way back in my ninth standard, and we all know how BHU came up. Madan Mohan Malviya went all over the places without a penny in his pocket. And what he said was, ki desh ke har dwar par ek data khada hai, par kami un haato ki hai, jin mein wo apni bheed de sake. Everybody is willing to give you, but it is up to us to take it. This holds good when I entered into this journey of, uh, you know, science communication again after a pause of uh, 25 years. And I realized that, you know, at every nook and corner, there are people who want to hear you. And what Dr. Panda really said, without them, we're not there. It has to be uh, together. So I think a participation is a very important aspect in communication. And in order to achieve this, it has to be, a, it has to be an approach where we have to take two steps ahead. And I will find that there will be people coming four steps closer to you. In our endeavors, what we have realized is, we launched our first science and technology OTT channel on January 15th in 2019. We had tremendous challenges. We had uh, people saying, making science films. Science is normally considered a very dry and drab subject and very difficult to you know, create that sort, sort of interest. And that communication science thing and art thing that we've been talking about has been a major challenge because in the name of art, what we normally do is we at times dilute the science that we need to communicate. So communicate effectively without losing the essence, right, of what science is and yet making it interesting is a, is a challenge. And it is something that if, and in our whole system, we do not have a formal school of training and we have science communicators who either come from journalism or scientists who had passion to Right, right. So this is how we have come through. All that we have learned is by virtue of experience. And with this present day uh, situation where we have technology rapidly changing. If you recall, there were times when you used to get glued to the television to watch these soap operas. It's time now that 
we hardly watch a message which is longer than 30 seconds or so. And if there is one longer, we keep on passing to them. I am a victim. My wife passes all everything which is a little longer and I'm supposed to look into it and tell her what it is, right? So this is, this is a general thing that happens. And so for, for us as science communicators, particularly uh, in the area of medical sciences communication, I think we have a message, we have a duty, we have a responsibility. And the most important thing is the correctness and completeness is a key issue that we normally as science communicators at times fail. And now that everything is shrinking, and as I said, 30 seconds, I usko wrap up karna, usko uske andar samahit karna, ek baut badi chunati hai. Aur uske liye, aap koi bhi formal school of training mein karein, wo possible nahi, jab tak aapke paas case studies nahi hai. For example, surgeons are much better surgeons the more surgeries they do. Pilots are more better pilots the number of hours they do. Similarly, science communicators do have a same kind of a situation with the more they write, the more they interact, the more they come up with. And this, for all of this, I tell you, also depends on the language. Like ma'am rightly said, language is a critical issue. And language, kab samrad hoti hai, jab language ke andar experiments karte hain. Jab uske andar itne saare nai nai idioms, phrases ko laate hain, jo uske, uh, uske liye relevant ho. So I think uh, over a period of time, we are maturing, and with new technology coming, I think we're getting into that phase where we are getting much more effective in our communication. Thank you. Thank you. Um, those are nice perspectives from your, uh, you know, personal uh, association with communications. Uh, but as Marshall McLuhan once said, message itself is a massage. It just gives that, you know, great feeling to the people that they have known something, but people don't go beyond that. Uh, my question comes from where, um, you know, you've pointed that the organizations have to have the temper of researching and communication you know, the vertical of communication. Actually, I had parked this question for a later time, but since you brought the topic up, I thought I'll ask you, uh, are our science organizations ready for a vertical in science communication? Because, uh, and if so, uh, in science communication research, you know, I, I deal in communication and then many of us do, and then the first question that everyone asks, even you, have, you would have faced this many times, when you communicate science, uh, how many have you reached, how many people's behavior have you changed? Uh, being a single person, being a few of us, where do we reach? How many nooks and corners of the country do we reach? We have our own limitations of language and things like that. So is the proof of concept more important or is reaching out to numbers, millions, messaging to the millions, which is important? So there are two questions in my uh, statement. One is, are the research organizations and science organizations ready for uh, vertical in science communication research. And the second is, if we are taking that research forward, what do we work for? Do we work for proof of concept or do we work on reaching the millions? I think all three of you should answer this question, one after the other. Uh, thank you. So the first question which you have said uh, about the vertical in the organizations, I think now this is the time when every organization should have vertical in the science communication. Uh, Dr. Rajnikanth gave that presentation in the beginning and he, uh, you know, took us for the journey like how ICMR was not having a proper uh, communication vertical and now how it has grown uh, in last two decades and how it has made ICMR as a brand and how it is contributing. So I think for ever, because Indian S&T ecosystem is so vast and now after 75 years very proudly we can say it's very robust where we can talk eye to eye to any Western country. And if we leave this science communication only to few, uh, you know, science communication organizations like Vigyan Prasar or Nispar or some other, it's not going to work. Again, when particular organization is having a science vertical within the organization, definitely they will be having the much better understanding of the subject, much better understanding of the issues, and then definitely there should be interlinkages. These verticals should be horizontally linked also. Not only organizational verticals, but those ver verticals should be horizontally linked to other organizations also. So I believe there should be one, and that should be strengthened by horizontal linkage. Second thing which you said about the uh, proof of concept and about the numbers. 
I believe to have an impact, both are important. Because if you have a very good proof, proof of concept, but you are not reaching to the masses, you are not reaching to the audience which you wanted to, we are failing in our uh, you know, objective. So to have the right uh, impact, both are important that we create a good science communication message or report or a story, whatever the form is, and then we take it to the maximum number of people. Because in science communication, we all have felt, uh, particularly in this time when Dr. Nakul Prasha is saying the message, uh, you know, moving from one person to another person, it creates a buzz, a right, a right concept if it is there and if it is going to the masses, that will make a perspective, that will make a, you know, atmosphere about that issue I wanted to convey to the society. So for me, both are important. Uh, I will not, com uh, you know, compromise with the concept with the numbers. Right. So both, both are important for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, uh, two, two uh, issues that you raised, uh, Dr. Rao. Uh, one is, should there be a vertical with the, with the science institutions, uh, so far science communication is concerned? Absolutely under a resounding yes. Why? Why so? Because whatever science we do, we do it with the public you know, ta uh, money, it's taxpayers' money. So it's imperative on us. How to improve our skill? Think of what uh, Dr. Rajinikanth showed, um, um, Einstein's photo and uh, our inability to talk simply about whatever we have found out. That's, that's our problem. We cannot indicate to, to people that, oh, this is high-flying science and you won't understand. Sorry, there is no scope for it. So it's a resounding yes. There is no other go about it. Uh, we are doing research, whatever research we are doing in any field, be it socio-behavioral science, laboratory science, clinical science, epidemiology, doesn't matter. But it involves taxpayers' money. So it's our responsibility to convey the findings in a manner that is understandable. And uh, how to have that, that's upon us, not on them. So clearly, yes, uh, there is no second thought about it. Now, the second bit is about mm, how many do you reach out to, or it, should it be just a proof of concept? There, um, I only didn't learn from you know the community of uh, a community of people who had a problem uh, or were facing uh, some issues. I also learned from journalists. I do have friends, you know, and uh, they told many inside um, you know stories about how things are looked at. So they told me repeatedly, uh, which I of course passed on to Professor Bhargav repeatedly, um, that never ever speak um, uh, about more than three points, okay, three points. So in order to have an intended behavior change in sufficient number of people, again, three points. And um, one, to, to resonate with the audience. So basically, identification. If you are messaging in such a manner, I'm talking about science communication here, and if you are getting identified with the audience, that's that's the first point you need to, you need to know. So the, the language that you were choosing and the way you were expressing. The second one, particularly with regard to behavior change, it's a golden rule not to focus only on individual. We have to focus on social norms and the individual because focusing on an individual immediately leads to another problem, which is stigma. We start stigmatizing. And it's not only about HIV AIDS, even in COVID. So that's a great lesson learned. So if, uh, if our intention is to have a behavior change in sufficient numbers, which will have a public health impact, so that certainly requires reaching out to a number. So there, focusing on both social norms and individual uh, is very important, and not just individual, because it would inadvertently lead to stigmatization. Third and most important is strategic communication, where the campaign gets linked with multi-sector you know, players or the stakeholders. So these are the three things, and there it is possible with these three key rules, probably, to go beyond the proof of concept and to reach out to many. Right, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> I think the uh, unanimous answer to your first question is yes. Uh, associated question about the preparedness of, of the these institutions is, of course, at the moment, not very encouraging, but 
uh, when there is nothing like this, it gives you a chance and opportunity to do so. So it's important for all of us out here. It's just not this for Vigyan Prasad or ICMR. I think it's a call that everybody out here whoso have, whoso has a position or is in a decision-making place in these institutions should work to get such a division, even if it is one or two. Because, you know, whatever research that we do in our labs need to reach to the masses to make it that whatever we have done is just not jungle mein mor nacha kisne deka kind of a thing. But also, it's, it's important, as Dr. Panda rightly said, it's about the taxpayers' money. It's about people knowing what's happening. And for that matter, uh, I'm glad that DST, Department of Science and Technology, has a program called AFSAR, Articulating Writing Skills for Augmenting Scientific Research, where youngsters doing PhD and postdocs are encouraged to write stories, and these stories are then awarded at national level. So this has created a lot of those unsaid, and that zeal that is hidden behind, within us to write, that the author hidden us has gotten up. up. So the, invoking that is very important. Interrelated uh, question of yours, which talks about proof of concept and numbers, and I guess it answers, uh, talks about the preparedness. And I think it's time for all of us that we, it's just not mass communication, it's just not communication or, you know, uh, this area, but it's time when we should realize that this opens up a humongous opportunity for jobs for people in this area. We have so many mass communication colleges, we have so many places. If we can include credit courses in science communication in these, and then promise them that all these research institutions will have a cell, science communication cell, which will make it important to, for that person that gets into the cell, walks up to every uh, you know, researcher or doctor and gets this. Why this uh, example came to my mind? I grew up in a family where my father was director of publications in the G.B. Pant University of Agriculture and Technology. And he was a die-hard agricultural scientist, but was into science communication. And he used to call in all these uh, professors in agriculture science every evening to our home and tell them how to write books. And books, not in English, but into Hindi. Hindi. So that the farmer, farming community in that area has adequate text. All those colleges, agriculture colleges in places like Shamri, Barat, and all these places have courses in Hindi to be taught, and they didn't have text for that matter. So created that, and I'm glad to say that m many uh, agricultural scientists of repute came up, wrote books, got awards, and that created, that enhanced that spirit to write books and in, get into science communication. How many of them are alive or not is a secondary question. But examples of this, yes. you know, they shouldn't just be located, uh, you know, confined to this. So I guess uh, answer to both yeah. your questions is a big yes. Right. Uh, now we are left with about uh, four to five minutes and then we'd like to take uh, two quick questions and then uh, see, uh, I mean, directed to any of our panelists. Anyone wants to ask a question? Please identify yourself and then ask your question. There are no questions? It's either too explicit that you talked about is so good that everyone is now, every doubt is dispelled or everything went above the head. <laughs> so no questions? Then I'll, uh, my last point that I wanted to ask is about uh, the intergovernment uh, interactions and then communication. When we talk about science or health communication, it's usually, I hate to use the word beneficiary or the target population of the masses, but we are always our aim is at an individual behavior change and to the people. But there's a lot of communication that needs to happen between the organizations and with the policy makers. It's not always top down kind of an approach. Sometimes it's lateral, sometimes it's bottoms up. So in that context, uh, I think, uh, what we need to do uh, is one thing that always uh, pesters a lot of uh, communications, uh, science communication people. If you have any magic wand for that or a mantra for that, please uh, tell us. Uh, actually, the question you have asked about, uh, you know, the 
communication uh, among the organizations and uh, you know at this point of time there is so much information flowing and we do not know the source of that information whether that information is right or wrong so you have enough information very important role for this organization is to filter out the you know rubbish from that mass information and provide the right information to the society this is very very important in today's time and also interconnectivity i think is very important first of all the science is becoming interdisciplinary multidisciplinary so it's very important that various stakeholders uh, come at one platform and discuss about the issues what kind of challenges are there also we have lots of things to learn from each other and unlearn many things you know and relearn many things from each other so that should be there and also sometimes we are doing repetitive efforts you know i am doing the same thing you are doing the same things uh, our messages uh, or our communications may be uh, you know slightly better or slightly worse something like that but probably our you know we can be more emphatic in giving that communication if we are talking properly Amongst with each other yes. so i think that interlinkages is very important particularly among the science communicators and there are you know not enough platforms yes. for science communicators to interact so we thank icmr for creating yes, one such uh, <laughs> platform extremely extremely so i think that it's very important right. thank you uh, any of you sir you want to take uh, this right, uh, the answer point is on one word it's more the merrier yeah. because uh, uh, science communication as we all know is uh, always uh, at the bottom of the entire ecosystem and it's important it's everybody talks about it but in order to have that implemented it's important to have uh, as much as that can be done and as far as redundancy or repetitiveness is concerned i would say uh, we've got very limited and we've seen times when we have bigger ships like science today and others that were there not only science magazines but we had illustrated weeklies and all the all those big ships have sunk so it's time for us to build up such new in all whether it is print electronic social and digital media so the more the merrier right you asked for two two mantras uh, and i will i will uh, talk from our experience of dealing with covid-19 with professor varga of course um, first of all your question was interministerial or intersectoral yeah. uh, communication and how does it happen the simple mantra is uh, look at each other's eye and talk so because the the sectors don't talk uh, with each other don't even look at uh, you know each other so but that that might sound silly so what we did actually during covid-19 of course um, at the behest of the ministry of health and family welfare and other ministries is that we prepared a list of resource persons not necessarily only associated with icmr so all the experts communicators they were from different sectors and it was a resource persons list and they were addressing a set of questions so there was an unition you know there was no a uh, conflict that's one and second if you really and your second thing was about the policy makers and if you really want to have effective communication for policy makers uh, professor bhargav is a cardiologist he did not do cardiology trust me uh, over the last uh, two years what he was doing and i was doing was liposuction what is liposuction <laughs> people will have 10 <laughs> slides and people hated us we knew but finally they realized by doing the liposuction we brought down the number of slides from 15 or and it includes icmr scientists also yeah. okay i'm not naming anyone but we will bring it down to three or four because we knew that the attention span of the policy makers is so little because of not that they are uh, you know deficit in paying attention they thousands of things to do yeah. be it health minister health secretary whoever yeah. Yeah. so liposuction is the mantra so if you have prepared 15 or 20 slides try bring it down to 5 and you will succeed to have your advocacy done with the policy makers so liposuction under able hands that's under important. able hands even if you are cardiologist you are able to do it or an infectious disease person Fantastic. or an epidemiologist excellent and i think this has been a very very uh, excellent session and then you know we've got people I mean, our panelists speak from their personal experiences. And one last uh, poll again, is communication a science or an art? You have a question? 
you have a question i think we are now past the time we can chat over a cup of tea i think later if that's fine um, and quickly the poll uh, is communications <laughs> now how many of you said it was a science now say it's an art how many of you said art now say it's a science i think it's both whatever it is whether you believe communication is science or an art <laughs> i think it's scientific art art so it's nice uh, nice very 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 nice session which got uh, all of you uh, get interacted with each other and whatever it is whether you believe it is science or whether you believe it is art all that we need to have is heart for the millions of this country thank you very much and thank my thank panelists much. for their excellent points thank you so much dr subrao and because i have the mic i can say that i believe it's a magic mix of both thank you so much to our panelists for your lessons for your insights and uh, for your mantras and now moving forward um, we do have a little i think everyone has had a lot to think about and uh, plenty to chew on so maybe we can move forward for our tea break uh, once uh, I, I believe everything has been laid outside and uh, perhaps we can hope to get back in about uh, 15 minutes so just past 5:25 you might also find a small surprise waiting for you outside conflict between health and diseases has been eternal. Good health brings happiness and diseases bring sickness and death. Back in 1911, when M.K. Gandhi was yet to become a Mahatma and New Delhi was 20 years away from being named capital of India, Indian Research Fund Association or IRFA was born with the mandate to promote medical research in the country. IRFA was renamed as Indian Council of Medical Research or ICMR in 1949. With Pan-India presence through its affiliated institutes and field stations, today ICMR is the apex body in biomedical research in India. All of them are tirelessly working together to overcome fatal human diseases through path-breaking research. When tuberculosis was a threat, the scientists at ICMR tested and validated DOTS, which has cured millions of patients suffering from TB. When leprosy struck millions, ICMR scientists tested the multidrug therapy with success. When diarrheal diseases become a leading cause of child death and suffering, ICMR facilitated and scale up for low-cost oral rehydration therapy and successfully worked on an indigenous vaccine for rotavirus-related diarrhea. When malaria became an everyday fear, ICMR tested new drugs and diagnostics and demonstrated bioenvironmental approaches to control malaria. From landmark studies in the area, non-communicable diseases included in Diab's study for diabetes and hypertension. With the growing human population, new drug resistant strains have also emerged and pose serious problems in complete cure of the infection. Constant research in this area is the name of the art. ICMR has created a network of antimicrobial resistance networks to monitor drug resistant organisms various etiological issues and genes involved in this mechanism to help in better drug delivery and formulating appropriate drug policy. From time to time, ICMR has released guidelines on various important issues along with maintaining a clinical trial registry to increase transparency and accountability. ICMR has played an integral role in touching lives of every Indian in more ways than one. Development of commercial diagnostic kits against dengue and chikungunya, 
direct agglutination tests for early diagnosis of Taliban, development of vaccine against Plasmodium forest disease and Plasmodium encephalitis, affordable glucometer and kits for diabetes, magnifying device for cervical cancer screening, personal protective equipment for source workers, and these are only a few examples. With the changing global scenario, ICMR is well-equipped to deal with the emerging and re-emerging diseases with advanced and state-of-the-art laboratories and research facilities with the highest and most stringent biosafety levels. Moreover, ICMR eradicating the diseases like polio, neonatal tetanus, guinea worm, and have helped in controlling many diseases. And behind this determination,
time uh, and agreed to be part of, of this conclave and for putting up such a good and entertaining and yet informative show. Uh, and uh, before we move to our next panel, um, I'd like to request uh, Ms. Mamta Sahai to please come up on stage. And uh, Dr. Renau, Dr. Priya, you know, it would be very nice if you, we could uh, play, who, again, needs no introduction, a uh, former uh, ADG of uh, the ICMR and who currently serves as the Director of Research at the P.T. Hinduja Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai. Uh, a warm uh, round of uh, uh, applause for, every, for everyone on stage. Thank you. Next, uh, we have uh, Ms. Sophia Lonapan, who serves as the National Program Officer for Public Health and Risk Communications at the WHO, WHO India Country Office. And uh, Sophia has actively worked in the field of behavior change communications. And uh, finally, our moderator for the panel, uh, Ms. Riddhi Makol, who is the Deputy Health Editor at Hindustan Times, and is well known for extensive understand her extensive understanding of the health landscape. And before we begin, may I invite uh, Dr. Ina Dogra Gupta and Dr. Priya Gore uh, from ICR to please felicitate uh, our guests. Okay, we'll begin with Ms. Cole. Next, Dr. Bang. Dr. Sanjay Mahindale. And last but not least, Ms. Lonapan. Thank you, and now uh, over to you, Ms. Cole, and our panelists for the next session. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope I'm audible enough. So first of all, let me begin with welcoming all of you on behalf of these seasoned communicators, as our mod uh, recept person who just introduced all of them just said. So all of them are indeed seasoned communicators. So I welcome all of you on this um, ICMR Public Health Communications Conclave. So just to begin with, uh, there was this long list of things that I have been handed over and I've been trying to read, but three words that kind of stuck with me are behavior change communication. So now three very, very powerful words. And what I understand of it is how do we communicate since I'm also in the business of communication. Uh, I'm a journalist, but yes, that's essentially what we do. We, try and communicate in the simplest of manner the most complex issues. I mean, ask the doctors, we chew brains of, I mean, they, we ask them, you know, just simplify things for us so that we can simplify it for the readers who are reading it because they obviously are not all scientists and doctors and researchers. They are common people who need to understand what is being said. So uh, behavior change communication. Let me begin with, I think, um, Dr. Mendele. So uh, in your field, I, I, there's a long list and a lot of things that has been said, but I want to know from you, what do you understand of it and what were the challenges that things that you have, projects that you have taken up, how have you managed? Okay, thank you so much. See, one thing I must submit at first is, already one HIV person has spoken to you about it. Now you have another HIV person you are going to talk to. But both of us will agree on one thing for sure, that this is a very difficult area to work on. And I would maybe like to address your question from two perspectives. One is that of a program, and the other is that of a research. So there is a basic difference as far as communication is concerned with the so-called targeted populations or the recipients uh, or beneficiaries of this. What I believe is as far as the program is concerned, you have time uh, and you can take your time, you can use a variety of methods and approaches to try and give the required messages to people. But in research, this uh, situation is slightly different. You have a defined time frame already available or given to you and within that you have to deliver. I'll give you some examples here as to how things uh, appear difficult. One uh, is 
Th this is in the beginning of the HIV AIDS era and we were sitting in our clinic, newly opened clinic at that time in National AIDS Research Institute. The uh, clinic was situated in National Institute of Virology at that time. We didn't know, we were just talking uh, to each other. There was a uh, internationally sponsored study and an international collaboration there and which involved some sample transfer. We did not notice a particular person who just came and who was standing behind us at that time. And he was silently listening to all of this. And we were shocked the next day to see a paper, newspaper headline in Indian Express, Nari is selling blood to foreigners. We uh, Basically, we were talking about co collecting some blood samples which were supposed to have been sent as a part of that international collaboration. But this was the internal meeting just was restricted to a few people and that's why all the uh, nitty-gritties of why this was happening how this would happen what are the regulations they did not get discussed the person only picked up this particular aspect so how sometimes these uh, areas can become problematic is one aspect another story i will tell you and that was a death happened in case of one person who had visited our clinic that time uh, and uh, he came to the clinic, uh, got, got himself whatever treatment uh, was expected to be given to him, went back home and died. Well, this is bound to happen uh, for anybody who is visiting a hospital setup. Not that everybody comes to you is in a uh, top condition so that, that that person will recover all the time. But the local PA, uh, the group of activists, they called us and they said, tomorrow we are going to put this particular patient on the stretcher. This, this was a place in Sassoon Hospital, which is a couple of kilometers from where we were located. And we are going to bring a procession to your place. Now, this became a very big emergency issue. And we had to do some kind of uh, rapid communication efforts to try and sort out these kinds of problems. And you know, therefore, program has always some kind of a backing of the government, which the research does not necessarily have. That's another distinction which I would like you to make. And so the whole and sole responsibility, as uh, Dr. Bhargava mentioned in his initial remarks, you are, the, you are facing the people. Uh, if you are getting a praise, you are also likely to be stoned at the same time. So we learned that this can be a problem. So th these were some of the issues. HIV AIDS, as I said, was a pretty tricky issue. And so we realized you it asked. Still is. It still yeah, is. Yeah, it still is. But you asked about uh, one particular uh, project. And I will just like to give you an example of HIV vaccine trial that we did. That was the first phase one vaccine trial ever done in the country. And uh, so this was not again patients. They were healthy volunteers. So uh, who would really uh, readily participate in an HIV vaccine trial. There are some people here in the audience, Anjali has left, but Anjali was also a part of that. That time it was International AIDS Vaccine Initiative that was very active partners with us. And they trained us very well. Actually, I was filmed as a PI. They, were, uh, they made me sit in front of a camera, actually filmed me asking some big nasty questions. And actually the kind of expressions, how they changed from my face, how I should have responded, how I, I did not respond well to a particular question, how, how I responded well to a particular question, all this, all this happened. So this kind of training, I believe, also is very useful. That's something which uh, I found very interesting because I, uh, as has been mentioned earlier, we are not, we are never taught communication skills. To some extent, we all learn it over a period of time as a part of our whatever job that we do. But obviously, it makes a whole lot of difference if somebody really teaches you the basic principles. And uh, that is how this helped me a lot uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the HIV AIDS vaccine area. We involved community in a very big way for communication awareness part of it. And two specific approaches we uh, built for this was one was community involvement plan. We involved six na uh, NGOs and CBOs based in Pune. And with them we identified some peers and we held community based meetings to identify volunteers. This worked pretty well as a strategy. And second thing is we also set up a, a community advisory board that was one of its first kinds in uh, India. And I suppose so community engagement of this kind was something which again I, I learned was a very useful thing for communication. So when we talk about uh, reaching out to people, 
communication exactly. specialist, especially that's their job, effectively reaching out. How successful was it? What the, the strategies that you just pointed out? How how much did you manage? We did. I mean, this ultimately, how is research judge? So if you are able to recruit in your study the enough number of people who are expected to be recruited, if you are able to retain them into your study, which is very tough, requiring nearly 20 visits over a period of one and a half years, that is the success of your study. And so I thought we were able to do that effectively. I'll just uh, give one more example, if you permit me. There was another very challenging study that we carried out. It was a study on HIV discordant couples. So one po partner positive, the another partner the other partner negative. And the idea was to try and initiate antiretroviral therapy at soon after uh, diagnosis in the infected patients so that transmission to the un uninfected partner could be prevented. And I would say the real success of this particular uh, project was in this, uh, that at our site, we through this, and, but it was expected that we would do normal communication and counseling to ensure that we give all the information to the people how HIV transmission can be prevented. And I would say, just to answer your question, none of these couples that were uh, enrolled in the study, even single zero conversion did not happen. So I believe uh, if you are persistent, if you are good, and if you talk to people very clearly and in a transparent way, they listen to you and adopt. That is the behavioral change that we are talking about. Uh, coming to you, Dr. Bang. Uh, in your experience, how much has the role of communi good communication, effective communication played in reaching out to people you wanted to, the target population? I believe you have dealt largely with tribal population, if I'm not mistaken. So how has your experience been like? I think when communication occurs, there are two sides, a communicator and those to whom we communicate. Then uh, there is, of course, a media a medium. but Usually we, the public health persons or medical persons or scientists or communicator, focus on how do I want to change that person. Now I would like to start by saying that we, the communicators, we, the change must begin with ourselves. We must be the change yourself that you want to see. Gandhi's famous statement, but I'll very briefly tell you how this Gandhi statement is powerful. My father was professor of economics, freedom fighter, and was being sent in 1946 to the US for studying economics further. He went to Mahatma Gandhi to seek his blessing before his departure. So Gandhiji uttered only one sentence. Arthashastra seekhna hai to America ke bajaye Bharat ke dehato mein jao. Right outside Bapu Kuti, my father tore away his passport and travel documents and started living in a village with his family when I was born. So I once asked my father, what was the power of Mahatma? He uttered one sentence and that changed your life. My father said when he told me to go to the villages, if he was sitting in Rashtrapati Bhavan, I would have ignored him and would have straight away gone to the US. But when he asked me to go to villages, he was living in that Seva Gram in a hut. He was sitting on a bamboo mat. So every word became a mantra. So power of communication originates from one who gives, the, gives out the communication be the change ourselves. It must be visible in our own personality, our own character, our own behavior. Secondly, I am not very sure how good listeners we are. We expect masses to listen to us, but we don't listen to masses. And I'll not repeat that story because I have mentioned it several times, but I we learnt it very hard way when we tried to impose on the tribal people of Gadichuli sickle sale as a research priority after the complete project and after I, have, I had received some state award for that work. Tribal people said, we have nothing to do with this. It is your business, you solve it. We gave you a drop of blood because you asked for it. This is you. Did you ask us? So we learned from that and we started going from village to village and uh, organizing meetings with the villagers around night fire, 
when they spoke out. Then we, are, we, we called a tribal health assembly. People of 50 villages and ask them, what are your health priorities? Now, we made a mistake. Now you tell us. 1995, they, go, they gave us six diseases as they, what they thought were their priority. I'll not list all of them, but one of that was our children die, child mortality. Second was malaria. Third was alcohol and alcoholism. Fourth was, you will be surprised, low backache. Now these four problems have given us a lifelong research agenda. I am still working on these, only these four problems, largely. <laughs> Listening to people gives you great ideas as to what people need before we start imposing our ideas on them. Now look at this low backache and alcohol. In 1995, when I spoke about it, people in Delhi laughed at me. Policy makers said, kya doctor, bang, kya baat kar rahe? Thodi dusri baat karo, family planning ke baat karo. Aap child mortality bahut effectively kam kar rahe, very good uski baat karo. Today, global burden of disease studies, 25 years later, has identified low backache as one of the topmost causes of loss of daily. Alcohol and tobacco as one of the two risk factors out of the top seven risk factors world over, causing death, disease, disability. People of Gadichili knew it 25 years earlier. Listen to the people. Before you design your communication, listen to the people, which we don't usually. But it's extremely advantageous. Even for your own benefit, I would, I would request you, listen to the people before you open your mouth. Third thing, Long ago, we conducted one field intervention trial of pneumonia management in children. Now, I wanted to convey to the people that if, if your children have pneumonia, and how do I convey? So, we, we did some research on the words people use for the topic we want to convey. So, for pneumonia, local people had a word, dabba. So instead of saying pneumonia ke liye treatment lo, dabba ho gaya to treatment lo, quickly. Then the one feature of pneumonia is that child becomes breathless. Now how do I tell them? Child is dysnic or breathless. So what are the words they use? We found that they have two words, lahak and dhapa. So if your child has lahak or dhapa, seek treatment. Then WHO said that the Intracostal indrawing is not really good indication, subcostal indrawing. So now I was puzzled. Went back to the people and asked them, do you have word? They said, yes. Why are you so much worried? We have a separate word for subcostal indrawing. That's called balkusha odne. For every refined medical sign and symptoms, people in their vocabulary, in their lexicon had a specialized word. If you know that, communications become such easy then you don't have to design your own word and lexicon trying to simplify English scientific words into... Ga Gandhi was master of this art. For an equitable, fair society, he knew there was no point in bringing the Western ideals of liberal ideals and telling the masses of India. So he used the word Ram Raj. Obviously, he didn't mean Ram means Ayodhya ka Ram. What he meant was... a a, 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 a rule which is fair, which is fair. And he knew that the Indian people understand this language. So linking to the tradition, linking to the lexicon that the people use makes our communication much more effective. In this pneumonia management treatment, in a society where there was practically no pneumonia case management available, when we introduced this with this communication plus Antibiotic, which is so effective as you all know. In the, in the first year itself, the coverage reached 76%. In the second year, coverage reached 106%. This trial has been published in the Lancet. But communicating in a traditional society that if your child has symptoms suggestive of pneumonia, seek care, take antibiotic, child will be cured. Can be done very effectively. I think I should stop here. 
there's something that I picked up uh, from you, from your this just five minutes that we spent listening to you, that it's not just the tribal, the marginalized people it's difficult to communicate to. I think it's also the policy makers to drive home the point that there's something that could be a problem later on in life. That, you know, to drive that point across is another art, I guess, for which we need different, difficult, and really specialized communication specialists, I think. So now moving to Sophia, I just want to know, because you, in a way, are the technical support, right? Uh, we, Dr. Mahendale just said that we need specialized communicators. So uh, do you really think, especially in talking of in, uh, talking in to Indian context, if we talk about, so do we really have people who are specialists? Or is it just we pick up randomly if somebody has a flair for it, you know, we, oh, this guy probably fits the job. But when we talk about trained people, how behind are we? Um, thank you. So uh, actually, I'm not trained by <laughs> Uh, qualification to be a risk communication specialist here and what I have learned and what I continue to do for the last I think 15 years continues to be what I picked up you know during my uh, entire career of work and uh, the question is do we have specialists yes now you know I think maybe perhaps 15 20 years down the line we didn't really have those colleges we really didn't have those courses that we looked at the nuances of behavioral insights, you know, or if you're looking at behavior change, or we are looking at perceptions. Now, uh, the stage that we are in right now, there are many institutions that are coming up with courses. It's fantastic that ICMR is coming up with a course to train scientists. Back then, you know, this wasn't there. So, uh, by fluke, no. You know, a lot of us in different institutes, you know, uh, ICMR is a classic example of this. Uh, I think I have been part of this journey where ICMR from the nodal uh, communication experts who are right now there, they're excellent communicators. You know, the last four to five years of training that have gone to them, uh, the last four to five years of training that have gone to them, they have really picked up the skill, they've honed it, and many of them are so much better than who you call experts today, you know, who are communicating. You know, case in point, you have Dr. Balram Bhargavya, Dr. Pandavya, you know, when they speak, you want to listen to them. And uh, I, one of the rules that I really like what Dr. Panda always keeps saying is the rule of three. Yeah. You know, these have been uh, the com in communication. We've always been taught this. And he continues to practice this. And he continues to share this wisdom. I think in journalism others. also, it's like, I mean, when we picked it up years ago, we were told, you know, if you can't say your story in first three paras, you're not saying your story at all. Nobody's going to go beyond those three paras. So I think it works well. Yeah, so I think uh, in a nutshell, I would say that where we are right now, we have uh, a lot of scientific institutes, a lot of academic institutes are coming up with scientists, are coming up people who have, no, who are able to tell, who are able to, I would say, combine the skill of the science and art of storytelling together and reach out to the masses. Uh, uh, Dr. Mahindale, coming back to you, uh, I want to know the challenges that you faced years ago. Are those the same, or ha have they evolved? Uh, are we facing something more, which is worse, or have things become a lot better? No, certainly, th things have evolved. Things have changed over a period of time. Uh, because uh, on, on one side, uh, the community or people who are participating in research or programs, they are more informed. They have an access to information. So even before they decide to participate in a particular study, they have got some knowledge already gained from various sources they have. At the same time, as researchers, maybe if I just look at myself, what I was when I began my career in ICMR, probably I did not know as much. And I did not give that, that much of an importance to communication. But I learned over a period of time. I, uh, I remember some of the field uh, investigations I did as a part of uh, my work in National Institute of Virology. That's where I started earlier. And how important it was to talk to people, how important it was to talk to their families, and also uh, to other sources in those villages to collect information that could eventually give us some clues about why that particular thing was happening. So uh, certainly things have changed, I would say. Uh, the there is a definite awareness among people that we cannot be scientists alone, but we need to be communicators as well. And uh, that's, that's the reason why many people are trying to deliberately uh, say, 
gather more skills, learn more skills to be good communicators. As far as the program is concerned, again, if you could just, I, I could just give a few, uh, say, examples uh, as far as National AIDS Control Program is concerned. One of the best programs that has uh, actually been implemented in the country, I would say, is the National AIDS Program in the recent times. And it involved uh, communities and people in a very big way right from the beginning. No doubt we adopted a kind of a Western model initially. And initially we, we were criticized also for that. Whether that's going to work in our country or not, we are not so sure. But over a period of time we realized that involvement of people living with HIV AIDS, having multi-stakeholder involvement uh, in planning various strategies, uh, this was important. See, like just one uh, example of a surveillance which is considered as the top class in the world today, which is con the HIV sentinel surveillance, which is conducted in, in our country by an ELA. So taking informed consent, if, if I just go back towards when this whole thing started in 1996, what's considered impossible at that time and whether people would ever be ready to give samples uh, for HIV testing knowing that this is what they are getting tested for. But things have changed. Now uh, we still, uh, but there are some issues we still struggle with. I mean I struggle with. Uh, we, I have worked in this area for so long but still I feel the words like high risk groups, the bridge populations, the general population, these kinds of words are commonly used. I suppose this in itself indicates presence of some kind of stigma that exists not in the minds of uh, maybe people themselves, but also in the minds of policymakers. So we probably have some more miles to go, but uh, things have changed definitely on the positive side. That's what I would say. Yeah, actually, that's what Sophia also said. That you know, things are far better now. But Dr. Bang, would, would you agree that the same challenges that you faced uh, some years ago when you started out probably are the same, or they have evolved? What What do you have to say to that? As we all know, there is an epidemiologic transition happening in India. And uh, 35 years ago, when I worked on childhood pneumonia, it was easy to treat childhood pneumonia, demonstrate it effectively, and reduce pneumonia mortality, diarrhea mortality, infectious disease. Now we are struggling with non-communicable diseases. I'm, I'm not taking COVID right now in this, uh, but NCD is a far more difficult challenge, not so easily amenable. You can't convince people, look, somebody who is eat, eating, to, consuming tobacco, and when I give him health education sermon, tobacco khaoge to cancer ho jayega. People are smart. They say, but in my village, 20 people are cancer. So they offer me 20 times or 100 times more powerful evidence. <laughs> it's very difficult to convince. And, and in a way, they are very logical, rational. They are eating, my father was eating, my father was eating, my father was eating, nothing happened. Not everyone who smokes gets cancer. Yes. Yeah, that's so the concept of risk in a quantitative manner is difficult to convince when the cause and effect is separated by 20 years incubation period of tobacco consumption. So this has become a difficult challenge, but I'll very briefly mention to you our struggle with a non-communicable, because it required different kind of communication strategy. As I told, people of Gadjuli had told us alcohol is our problem. By the time we worked on it, we realized it's not only alcohol, but tobacco also. We conducted a district sample survey of Gadjuli and found out that 41% male consumed alcohol, 44% population consumed tobacco, and the money they spent out of pocket expenditure on tobacco and alcohol was 373 crore rupees per year. This is, remember, this is one of the poorest district in Maharashtra. This was more than the district development plan of government. So how to control this? It was not easy as one disease, one vaccine, one antibiotic. So we designed a 360 60 degree communication strategy and that's what I briefly want to communicate. Because non-communicable diseases are more difficult to really change people's behavior. So 360 degree strategy is A, mass awareness generation, obvious. So I won't go in the details of it. B, 
policy change. As long as government is permitting or licensing alcohol sale, what is the point on my going to each and individual and saying in, giving sermons in the school, alcohol is bad, tobacco is bad. The state government is surviving on that. On the excise income, that is the number one income of the state government of Maharashtra today. And so unless there is a policy change in the government, we struggled for six years and finally got prohibition introduced in Gadchiruli. So mass awareness generation, <clears throat> but has to be backed by policy change. Government policy and what, what health education you are giving, if they conflict, you will be defeated. Third is, usually individuals don't change alone. Communities, group or societies change together. And so, that being a tribal rural area, we designed a strategy that a village can make itself Daru and Tambaku Mukta. So if village Gram Sabha decides, and if with lot of activism and awareness, Gram Sabha to decide whether alcohol and tobacco will be permitted in our village. Today, 600 villages in Gadjurli have completely banned and removed alcohol and tobacco from the entire village. That's Much good. more effective communication than trying to ask every each individual to wean away from. Fourth, but still there will be victims who are addicts. You can't stigmatize them. And so de-addiction for them. And finally, for policy makers in Delhi, quantitative scientific evidence. This intervention package that I discussed with you, we are running as a project called Muktipath, a district-wide pilot with the involvement of state government. The evidence that every year we conduct district sample survey, within four years, the prevalence of tobacco consumption has reduced by 29% and prevalence of alcohol consumption has reduced by 36% people are saving 80 crore rupees per year, which they were spending on this. Cost of the project, one and a half crore rupees per year. Benefit, 80 crore rupees per year. I do not know any more cost benefit better ratio. So this communication for the policy makers in Delhi. Thank you. <laughs> That was quite interesting, but I'm sorry we're running late behind schedule actually. So we have just one audience question that we can afford to take. So in case someone wants to ask the panelists, please. Thank you so much and uh, for your excellent uh, comments. Uh, yeah, my name is Roli Mathur um, and uh, I would like to tell you that we are all inspired by the kind of work that you have been doing related to community engagement. Uh, my worry is that uh, when we talk, because communication is one of the tools for ethics, for holding the ethical values and ethical considerations in our activities and actions. Uh, we see that we have guidelines for research in the area of ethics. When, we, when it comes to practice, uh, we have a different standard and we don't have that kind of a stringent system to monitor uh, that uh, activity. Similarly, when it comes to policy making, uh, do you think that there is a need of integrating ethics into policy making, including communication? Communication is one of the, uh, you know, tools that I see as ethics as a bigger umbrella. So how do we really integrate all these so that uh, the policies that are made or the practices that happen are more responsive, more sensitive to the needs of the people for whom they are designed in, take into consideration the socio-cultural milieu of our country. So I just <laughs> thought of taking your uh, thoughts on that. Thank you. No, I appreciate your concern, <clears throat> but I think this is too large a question which uh, I should try. But I, I, I'll just s say two, three sentences. I, I, am, I am in a way evading your question, and, and yet, look, every policy has to be based, based on ethics, and a policy cannot be unethical. Only question would be, 
the peop society has different population groups, different segments. And sometimes something which is beneficial for one group may, may not be beneficial for other group, or unfortunately may be even harmful for other group. And politicians have to really deal with very difficult challenge. They may or may not call it ethical, they'll call it a political challenge. To, do, to whom do I satisfy? But at one level, they are also dealing with that. Their criteria are a little different. Naturally, very naturally, their criteria are the votes. But they are dealing with this challenge. We have a constitution of India, or we have our own country's own past history and religion and culture and its own ethics. But I think policies have to be based on ethics. Uh, Dr. Roli, I, I also feel that when policy making is done, all ethical aspects are taken into consideration. But you know, policy makers are not executives uh, of any kind of a program, or it is not an executive body. So when, when, if we talk about health, if we are talking about who executes all these policies, eventually they are the health programs. And I suppose here is where the kind of problem which uh, you are referring to comes up. As Sir explained, there are tremendous uh, political influences, there are lots of people's vested interests in that, uh, implementing that particular program, not implementing that, that particular program, regional variations, and probably this, this is the, at the implementation stage where such issues do come up, rather than at policy stage. Uh, Sophia, would you want to add to it um, before we close the session? Uh, no, perhaps not. Okay, so that was a lovely and interest, interesting discussion. I hope you, all of you enjoyed as much as I enjoyed listening to all of them. Thank you so much for giving your time to us. Thank you to our panelists and of course our moderator. That was very, very enlightening. Hello everyone. In March 2020, the world as we knew it went into panic mode. COVID-19 was here. At this point, we turned desperately to news media, online and offline, as well as videos and posts on social media to fulfill the need for information. And it made sense because these forms of communication lend themselves perfectly 
to situations of emergency, where one must communicate in the here and the now, with ever-changing information that must be shared urgently so that precious lives can be saved. But now, in 2022, if we were to retell the COVID-19 story or document it for future generations, what do you think would be the most effective tool? We had an example of one such effective tool with Dr. Bhargav's book, but there is one more, and that is, drum roll, documentary films. Because you see, much like economics, which incidentally I studied before I went into filmmaking, documentaries work best in retrospect. They work when we already have a sense of the story that we want to tell, and they can do so in a very tidy and efficient manner. I am Aparna Sanyal, and a multiple award-winning filmmaker. Uh, my films have been uh, telecast on national and international television, on OTT platforms, the digital media. But what I'd like to do today is to share my learnings from having spent more than two decades telling stories using film. As filmmakers, we have the luxury of time and research, which allows us to immerse ourselves in depth into various kinds of narratives, which in health communication particularly, translates itself into a look at those with lived experiences of diagnoses, their caregivers, doctors, and other stakeholders. From that emerges a story that allows viewers a way to become an insider and to truly put themselves in someone else's shoes. I'd like to share at this point one of the first films I made on health. The film, A Drop of Sunshine, looked at schizophrenia and went on to be screened at many festivals, won awards, including the National Film Award in 2011, but more importantly, has been used for over a decade now in psychology classrooms, both in India and globally. The film was also translated into Hindi and both language versions were shown on Doordarshan, which meant that its reach was multiplied across demographics. Despite being freely available on YouTube, it has been downloaded multiple times and acquired by myriad stakeholders. I'll share with you at this point a short clip from the film, uh, which has excerpts from the beginning of the film, where the challenge for me as a filmmaker was to really bring home to the viewer what it meant to have a diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia. One day she was going, she, she just sat in the bedroom, she closed her ears and she said, Mommy, please tell him to go away, I cannot stand. And I never seen her like that. Well, I remember she started screaming and she said someone's outside the house. And I thought there were thieves or some, you know, you know, gangsters or something out of the house. And I was like, what is she saying? And then she's like, close the windows, close the windows. And I closed all the windows. Then I said, who are they? Because nobody was in the house, nobody was outside the house. She said, no, mommy, they, they are just making so much of noise. Tell them to go away, tell them to go away. Her, her symptoms were fairly severe, or I would say very severe, because she had all the hallmarks of schizophrenia. She had delusions, she had hallucinations, she had suspiciousness, she was acting out on it.
I had moments where I would scream and um, my dad would run and, and I would say I'm hurt and they hurt me and, my, and I would literally feel the pain. And he's like, why are you hurt? Because they kicked me, you know? Um, and I, they feel I'm a piece of shit and things like that. So those were the voices, those were the controlling voices where um, I wouldn't, I would want to watch something else on TV and I was told to watch something else. Which is, you know, I'm not the sort of the person who likes to be controlled, as you can see. You know, I'm quite I'm very, very rebellious and open, opinionated about things. So for me, it was just messing around with this entire race, me, as a person, you know. The amazing thing about this film, even now, more than a decade later, people with severe diagnoses of mental health still reach out to us to share how the film gave them a new lens with which to look at their own lives. This is really because films come with a 360 degree approach. They bring in nuance, emotion, and a human touch to health communication. Properly researched, art and science, remember, they allow space for conversations that are complex, thus creating not just impact, but also helping people take decisions with a sense of agency. But most importantly, because they employ the visual medium, films have a special superpower to live on within you long after they end. I ask you, is there any other medium with that kind of impact? Before I end, I'd like to share another short excerpt from another film on an equally difficult subject, palliative care and ideas around death and dying that we hold as a society. In this film, I spoke to critical care specialists and palliative care workers on the one hand to understand their rather equanimous approach to the idea of death and to families on the other to understand how palliative care had brought meaning to their grief over losing a loved one. It was both my most difficult and rewarding film so far. One mustard seed. Thank you. was that whatever is going to happen is going to be at home only. Because once the, 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 the situation she was in, once we move her to a hospital, directly she will be you know, put in an ICU or maybe in a ventilation. See, and uh, loneliness will be there because she was in her senses, right? No one will be there. You won't believe till her death, death Three of us, anyone comes to, I mean, sitting her, holding her hand like this. If I want to, you know, just want to take it away, she will hold it more like this. What does it mean? She wants company, right? She wants someone, I mean, her family, people to be around her. So those are the things, those are the reasons why we just decided like what is going to happen will happen at home only. Because we knew it was going to happen. So that was it. Please. Uh, Miss Anya, thank you so much for, uh, for your words and for sharing your art with everyone. I think it really 
You're absolutely right. You know, visual, audiovisual uh, messages can really bring that feeling and, and uh, make you feel uh, the reality of what you're, uh, you're, you're actually trying to say. So thank you so much. And uh, Kaushik Bose, uh, may I request you to felicitate uh, Ms. Sanya. So we're now moving to the penultimate session of uh, the day, uh, experiences from the ground reporting during public health emergencies. And uh, we'll be joined by journalists, um, a lot of whom, you know, well, all of whom, you know, we've actually read a lot of in the last, uh, particularly in the last few years, and uh, hear them uh, narrate their stories and how they actually saw uh, the ground realities unfolding. It'll be a very interesting perspective from uh, the other side that we've been exposed to um, this afternoon and, and earlier this evening. So while we set up on stage, uh, might I request uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sushmi Day, uh, the Senior Assistant Editor at the National Bureau at the Times of India, to please uh, join us. Mr. Nitendra Singh, who serves as a special correspondent at uh, Doordarshan News. Ms. Namita Kohli, a journalist with The Conversation. And Ms. Ridhima Kohl, the deputy health editor at the Hindustan Times. And finally, to moderate the session, uh, Dr. Pooja Sagal from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Dr. Sagal leads health communications at the BMGF and devises programs to work with and build awareness in communities on critical public health matters. And before we actually get started with the panel, uh, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Lokesh to please come on stage and felicitate our guests. Dr. Sagar. Ms. Day. Mr. Singh. Ms. Kohli. And Ms. Cole. Okay, well, we'll thank you for coming back on the stage and uh, we won't burden you with too many gifts today, <laughs> as beautiful as they are. Over to you, Pooja. Good evening, everyone. And good evening to this fabulous panel that I have with me here today. Media, we all understand, um, defines narrative, creates narrative. Uh, we've all seen the role that film and audiovisuals can play. We also heard a lot about how communicating to the audiences on the basis of the audience themselves is so critical. But we also know that the big role that media plays in terms of creating understanding, in fact, spreading the right information, sometimes even addressing misinformation or spreading it as well. And we've seen a lot of that play out um, 
especially in terms of health communications during this pandemic. So I'm quite excited about the conversation we're about to have for the next 30, 35 minutes here today. My first question to all of you actually is, the pandemic really changed health communications a whole lot. Um, I remember we had a research done many years ago, probably about seven, eight years ago, when we looked at some of the key publications uh, at the national level. And health largely was about less than one and a half percent of the coverage. That number significantly changed during the pandemic. And we expect maybe there's going to be some lasting change going forward as well. But if you could just sum up from your perspectives, Ki, what really changed? How much and what has really changed from a health communications perspective when it comes from the newsroom and the media lens? We'll start with you, Sushmi. Thank you. I'm not uh, really used to sitting on this side of the table. So uh, please forgive me if I, and do not misquote me <laughs> if I go wrong. <laughs> Do not take revenge. <laughs> okay. Uh, jokes apart, uh, you know, like what Pooja mentioned, that uh, health is, uh, health rarely finds itself uh, on front pages. We have to struggle. It's a daily struggle for us to find space in the paper. And uh, I'm saying this uh, coming from a paper which uh, which is a general paper which considers itself as we are the first paper. Uh, so, uh, and health is a is a public. It's something which which really impacts our readers. You know, the common man. Uh, in fact, which impacts everyone, starting from uh, uh, from you know, uh, at every level uh, uh, in the society. So we. Uh, I would say my struggle, and I've worked with various publications, and I'm, I'm therefore I'm comparing it and saying that you know, in, in my paper, my I have my struggle has been far far less than what it is in many other newsrooms. Still, having said that, and I've been told to uh, narrate stories because that's probably my job. So, uh, having said so, I'll just uh, uh, tell you a small story from the beginning, uh, or rather before the pandemic, uh, or before we started talking about COVID-19 in India. We, I, when, when I say we, I'm using a general parlance because I think most of you are scientists here who must have started talking or must have uh, known about SARS-CoV-2 much, much before we journalists started or people, you know, people at my home or my colleagues or uh, in the fraternity started talking about it. Uh, so weeks before uh, we started talking about it, I was uh, looking for a story like I do every afternoon because my boss is going to editor is going to ask me what is the headline today. So I, and I had no news. So I was uh, calling up people here and there and uh, reading up some journals. And uh, I read something about SARS-CoV-2 did. Uh, though we don't have the luxury of time and research in a daily paper, but tried to do gather something. And uh, I uh, listed, this, so list is basically before the edit meeting, we do a small listing, uh, briefing our editors about what we are going to write today. So I did that and I filed a story on SARS-CoV-2. COVID was still not known. It was not, it was still SARS-CoV-2 that we were talking about. I filed the story. Three days I re-listed it, so it didn't get carried. And I had no other story probably, because it was, we were talking about politi poli politics and the, there were many other important developments which were being talked about. Parliament was in session, session and all that. So, uh, the fourth day or the fifth day, probably, I get a mail from my editor saying, Sushmi, I have read, he sent me a clipping of a foreign uh, newspaper somewhere, and he said, uh, Sushmi, I've read this, this looks interesting, can you please check with the health ministry uh, if there is something going around it? So he's very aware and very well aware, and he reads a lot. And so I 
got the opportunity to respond back and I, I told him that, sir, I have been listing it for last three, four days and there is no interest, it seems. Uh, a couple of weeks later, we are all talking about COVID-19 and uh, everything is, every newspaper is talking about it. So, uh, it is because, it's not actually that there's no interest, it is because there are so many, so many things happening and uh, health to a large extent is very scientific. When I say SARS-CoV-2, it does not look very glamorous in headlines. It does not, uh, uh, you know, uh, my mother is not going to understand it if she has to read Times of India. So, uh, though I, I had at that point in time probably put the blame on the desk uh, or on someone who's planning the page or on my editor trying to say that you have not noticed it where, while I have, I've been listing it for last three days. Uh, somewhere there is a communication gap on my part also because I have not been able to convey to them that this is important, this is what it means. Uh, somewhere, somewhere my source or wherever I ca gathered that thing from was not able to explain to me that this is what it is leading up to. Or maybe in a pandemic situation he himself was not aware. So. Uh, Finding space for health is, is really difficult because it's very technical. It is something which is evolving every day. It is something which is impacting people every day, but yet uh, does not find itself uh, in the headlines because uh, the interests are not driven by it. So it's a challenge and there is more communication, more explanation, more simplification required in communication. And I think pandemic has been a game changer. It has, it has helped, it has uh, made a difference uh, in terms of bringing in far more interest in health. People understand uh, the scientific fraternity, the doctor's fraternity, journalists, editors, readers have become far more aware uh, it, uh, about, about health, about scientific issues, about what concerns. And I think um, uh, going forward, there'll be more stories and more headlines uh, related to health. That's what we can hope. My story is different because I belong to broadcast journalism. So, Doordarshan is a public broadcaster. So, it is a different responsibility and a different work of work. और मुझे बड़ा गर्व है कि आ, मैं पिछले 15-16 साल से हेल्थ मिनिस्ट्री और हेल्थ आ, कवर कर रहा हूं और मुझे जब मैं स्टोरी करता हूं तो वो स्टोरी ऑन एयर होती है प्रायोरिटी पे ऑन एयर होती है और डीडी में काफ़ी तवज्जो दी जाती है हेल्थ की तो अगर अभी मैं रिसेंटली कहूं तो अभी थोड़ी देर पहले मेरे पास डेस्क से कॉल आया कि वो एम्स वाली डॉक्टर की बाइट कहाँ है मंकी पॉक्स वाली तो मैं अभी बता रहा था कि ये इस नाम से मैंने इंजेस्ट करा एम्स मंकी पॉक्स नाम से तो अभी हेडलाइन भी है प्राइम टाइम बुलेटिन में और एक बड़ी डिटेल स्टोरी जा रही है मंकी पॉक्स के बारे में कल जब ये खबर ब्रेक हुई थी करीब शाम में मेरी सेक्रेटरी सर से बात हुई तो उन्होंने कहा कि हाँ केस कन्फर्म है उसके बाद मैंने अपने ऑफिशियल जो ग्रुप होता उसमें डाला कि पहला केस केरल में आया है तो ब्रेकिंग चली न्यूज़ फ्लैश चली कि पहला केस इंडिया में आया उसके बाद चूँकि ये साढ़े सात पौने आठ की बात थी और प्राइम टाइम आठ बजे से न्यूज़ नाइट मेरा शुरू होता है तो उसमें टॉप हेडलाइन में उसको अपग्रेड किया गया पहले तीसरी चौथी हेडलाइन होगी उसको अपग्रेड किया गया क्योंकि खबर थी फिर सेंट्रल टीम भी जा रही थी केरल में तो आप देखिए कि पहली खबर ब्रेक हुई हेडलाइन में आई श्रीलंका की राष्ट्रपति की सेकेंड हमारी स्टोरी आई और पहला फोनो उनका हुआ सेकंड फोनो मेरा हुआ अब थोड़ा मैं टर्नोलॉजी अलग अलग है फोनो हम डायरेक्ट बात करते हैं कि अभी केस आया है तो उसमें क्या कुछ हो रहा है किस तरह के प्रिकॉशंस रखने हैं क्या करने हैं तो आप सोचिए कि ये ओवर द पीरियड अगर 16 साल बनाम ढाई साल हम कहें तो वो भारी रहा हम लोग पे एक्सपीरियंस के आधार पर काम हम लोगों ने भी ज़्यादा किया और हर दिन हेडलाइन होती थी कोविड की जो स्टोरी है या कहानी है या जो भी चल रहा था क्योंकि सिर्फ हेल्थ को ही इम्पैक्ट नहीं कर रहा था ये अर्थव्यवस्था से लेकर के तमाम चीज़ों को इम्पैक्ट कर रहा था तो हर चीज़ कोविड में ही इन्वॉल्व था 
इससे पहले एच वन एन वन हमने कवर किया है 2009-10 की बात है उस समय कटोज साहब थे तो लगातार हम लोगों ने कवर किया उसमें भी हेडलाइन होती थी प्रायोरिटी होती थी लोग सुनना चाहते थे देखना चाहते थे तो पहली प्रायोरिटी होती है कि जनता चाहती क्या है इसके बारे में अभी आज भी हम लोग अगर मंकी पॉस की बात कर रहे हैं तो पहला कि इससे सिम्टम क्या है इसका बचाव क्या है इससे बचे कैसे ये हमारी कम्युनिकेशन में सबसे पहली प्रायोरिटी होती है कि लोग ये जानना चाहते हैं और सेम कोविड में भी हमने देखा चूँकि शुरू से मैं कवर कर रहा हूँ जब मंत्रालय में पहली बैठक हुई थी चूँकि हर बैठक में मैं कवर करता हूँ तो पहली बैठक के बाद क्या गाइडलाइन जारी हुआ उसके बाद किस तरीके से स्क्रीनिंग एयरपोर्ट पे हो रही है तो शुरुआत से ही हम कवर करते रहे और दूरदर्शन में लगातार इसको हेडलाइन के रूप में रखा गया लाइव भी होता था और काफ़ी इन्फॉर्मेशन हर बुलेटिन में जाती थी प्रिविलेज हमेशा रहा हेल्थ को प्रायोरिटी दी गई दूरदर्शन में और उसका उसकी वजह भी रही कि इन्फॉर्मेशन हमें मिलती थी इतने टेक्निकल आपके गाइडलाइन होते हैं इतने <laughs> उसको अब तेईस पेज का कल गाइडलाइन आया तो इस तरह के कोविड में भी आते थे तो उसको सिंपल तरीके से बताना दर्शक को डेढ़ से दो मिनट का हमें समय दिया जाता है कि अपनी कहानी आपको 90 सेकंड में कहनी है इससे ज़्यादा एडिटर हमें नहीं देता है समय तो उसमें हमें बताना है कि क्या सिंपल तरीके से लिखा जाए साथ में विजुअल भी होता है हमारे कैमरा पर्सन होते हैं चूँकि एक टीम वर्क की तरह काम होता है तो उस विजुअल के साथ हम क्या इन्फॉर्मेशन दें कि लोग अगर घर में देख रहे हैं तो वो कैसे उसको एक तरह से समझ सके तो पैंडमिक में काफ़ी कुछ देखा गया और अब अगर कैंपेन की हम बात करें तो मास्क एक बड़ा इशू था कि मास्क लोग पहनना नहीं चाहते थे या कई लोग उनको घुटन होता था कैसे मास्क पहने मास्क को लेकर के बहुत कैंपेन चलाया गया दूरदर्शन में तो हमारे लोगों के साथ लोगों जो डीडी न्यूज़ का लोगों और साइड में एक लोगों मास्क अप इंडिया का चलाया जाता था और हमारे एंकर भी मास्क पहनकर एंकरिंग किए तो एक मैसेज था कि किस तरीके से लोगों को मास्क के प्रति अवेयर किया जाए और जितने भी हम लोग लाइव करते थे मास्क पहन के करते थे तो मास्क कैसे पहना जाए इसके लिए भी छोटी छोटी वीडियो बनाई जाती थी हाथ धोने की बात हाथ धोना बहुत साधारण चीज़ है लेकिन पैंडेमिक में ये हम लोग को बताना पड़ा कि हाथ कितने सेकंड बीस सेकंड धोना है और कैसे धोना है और डॉक्टर गुलेरिया से हमने कराया था एक एम्स डायरेक्टर हाथ धोने की विधि बता रहे हैं तो आप समझ सकते हैं ऑक्सीमीटर एक छोटी सी बात है ऑक्सीमीटर कैसे लगाना है इसकी वीडियो बना के दिखाई जाती थी तो पैंडेमिक बहुत कुछ हुआ और दूरदर्शन ने काफ़ी इनिशिएटिव लिया काफ़ी अभियान की तरह चलाया और सात प्रोग्राम हमारे यहाँ चलाए जाते थे कोरोना वारियर हुआ डॉक्टर स्पीक होगा सर कितनी बार टोटल हेल्थ है हमारा इस तरीके से कोरोना जान है जहान है तो हर चीज़ दिखाने की कोशिश की गई किड टाइम था उस वक्त लॉकडाउन में बच्चे घर में थे उनको उनके लिए क्या किया जाए तो हम आधे घंटे का शो चलाते थे बच्चों के वीडियो मंगाया जाता था या उनको मास्क पहनते हुए या डांस करते हुए तो बहुत सारी चीज़ तो काफ़ी कुछ बदलाव आया पैंडेमिक में न्यूज़ के गैदरिंग में भी अच्छा हम लोग पहले कैमरा से शूट करते थे अब हम लोग आत्मनिर्भर हो गए मोबाइल में जूम से हम अब डायरेक्ट हम जो है यहीं से लाइव कर देते हैं हमें अब कैमरे की ज़रूरत नहीं होती है तो आत्मनिर्भर इस मामले में भी हो गए टेक्नोलॉजी के मामले में भी लेकिन एक बात हम कहेंगे कि जब शुरुआत में चूँकि कंटेनमेंट जोन में जाना पड़ता था तत्कालीन मिनिस्टर साहब थे वो भी बहुत जाते थे हॉस्पिटल में और इस दौरान एक दुखद घटना हो गई हमारे यहाँ कि हमारे कैमरा पर्सन संक्रमित हुए और उनका निधन भी हो गया था तो पहला कैजुअलिटी भी हमारे दूरदर्शन में हुआ था क्योंकि एक पब्लिक ब्रॉडकास्टर के नाते हमारी जिम्मेदारी है कि हमें हर हाल में हर चीज़ दिखाना ही दिखाना है और चार बजे का जो प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस होता था उसको लाइव कराने की जिम्मेदारी मेरी होती थी और मैं कोशिश करता था कि वो हर हाल में लाइव हो और समय पर मैं पहुंचता था और मेरी पहली प्रायोरिटी होती थी कि मैं संक्रमित ना हूँ <laughs> और ईश्वर कृपा रही या फिर मास्क मैं पहनता था तो मैं तीन लहर तो बच गया चौथे लहर में पकड़ में आया था <laughs> तो ये एक बदलाव आया Uh, I was just thinking while my colleagues on the panel were speaking, and I realized that, of course, much has changed, and we are all going to talk about the optimistic stuff that has happened. But it just struck me: uh, Did any one of you have any thoughts in the composition of the panel? Nothing. Okay. 
as you can see, I mean, Nitendra is of course breaking the stereotype here, but it's 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 dominated by women. That is the story of health reporting in mainstream Indian media. It is dominated by women, which is a great thing, but it is also a reflection of how health journalism, health communication has been understood in the Indian mainstream media up until now. It was seen as uh, a soft beat, if I may, uh, as something that uh, also been there. Uh, I mean, Sushmi spoke about the struggles of getting to the front page. And then COVID came and suddenly everybody in the newsroom was looking for a health reporter. Where is the health reporter? <laughs> Every beat, the, you know, the, the hierarchy starts with national security, politics, you know, those heavy sounding beats. And somewhere on the margins would be the health reporter saying, it's a very, you know, I have a story on TB, you know, it has to be written, it's waiting to be told. And editors would just blank out. Come COVID, and we were the only people who were working nonstop and always there uh, from, from, you know, uh, the VRs of the morning to the, you know, to, uh, to dusk or whatever. So, um, I think there is, uh, there is a realization of the importance of health communication, health reporting, and that leads me to two uh, kind of, I'll branch out into two things. One is the recognition of domain expertise. Now, what happened during COVID, uh, suddenly all the other people in the newsroom realized, hey, let's also be doing something, yaar, hum bhi kuch karte hain. So everybody jumped into health reporting, okay? What is observational study? What is a RCT? What is immunity? They did not know, but boss, story likna hai. So we have, <laughs> you know, we are sitting, the health reporters, for, I, I mean, I am part of this, uh, you know, uh, group of uh, writers and reporters and editors here who have spent so much time on the field. So they know their job. They know who is the right person to talk to. You know, if you have a story on vaccine, you know you have to go to ICMR. If you have a story on, uh, you know, uh, the clinical symptoms, you know you have to go to AIMS. But that, that sort of disruption has happened, but it has to move beyond tokenism. Indian media also needs to invest in, you know, it's, it's the health writers. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, where I now work in the conversation we have, which is a global platform uh, with uh, editions in eight different countries, uh, primarily Western countries, and it is now trying to launch into India. So, uh, so the the point is that we have these regular sessions with researchers because we uh, we are commissioning editors and we have researchers now write for us so we are trying to you know sort of promote domain expertise um, and we have these regular interactions with them where we try to understand what is it that you want to say what is the best way to say it so so both on the end of the writer and the end at the end of the editor there is an understanding okay if you're going to write about rc you know this 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 vaccine and you're going to talk about the rct that was done what is a rct you have to break it down okay so i know what is an rct he knows he or she knows what is an rct and then we go on this process so that uh, uh, that recognition and promotion and acknowledgement of domain expertise is something that really, really uh, we need to emphasize uh, here on. Um, the uh, the other uh, the other point I wanted to say that uh, so when I joined uh, this platform last year and we started working on the India project, um, there was an editor from Melbourne who. Um, who I had to meet and uh, we had to discuss what kind of pieces are we going to, uh, you know, commission in India. And the first thing he said, hey, you guys are making a vaccine, we want to know about that. And we have Dr. Balram Bhargava here and thanks to all of you, uh, COVID has made India a global story. And it is now up to us to take that story to you know, uh, to make it accessible not just to Indian 
audience, but also a global audience. So, um, so I think uh, I wanted to touch on these, uh, uh, you know, couple of things, and uh, it's heartening to uh, be here. Uh, uh, it takes me back to anyone from NIV here. Okay, yes, of course. Hello, hi. <laughs> So I remember, I mean, of course, Dr. Priya is here, I, and she'd remember our, uh, our meeting just when the world was about to change. Uh, but before that, I had gone to NIV also to do a story. Um, and I remember, you know, as journalists, we are like really used to just going and just like firing questions. Tell us, what is this, what is this, what is this? I land up in Pune, all the way from Delhi, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to ask all these scientists, like, what's happening and everything. And I'm made to sit in a, a conference room, and there are five, six scientists, and they come, and there is this air of, like, mystery and suspicion. Hmm, who is she? And they start asking, so, where are you from? What did you study? What did you study in graduation? Are you a student of biology? Are you a student? And so suddenly I realized I am being interviewed. <laughs> so I said, yes, of course, I studied journalism, but you know, blah, blah, blah. I read about your work and everything. So there is, there is that to this has changed, right? Now we are having a dialogue. We are talking to each other, like, how do we start? From the day that I was looked at, with great suspicion, and said, if you misquote us, you have had it. <laughs> and I wrote my story, and I'm like, oh my god, like, I hope everything goes okay. Of course, it all went well, and now we are all here as, I mean, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so it's, it's great to be having this dialogue. Actually, Namita said most of what I was planning to say, but I will still <laughs> add to it, try to at least. So 20 years in journalism, and the first thing that came to my mind, health journalism, health beat, was never taken seriously. I was really sorry to say that, but we were not finance reporters, we were not defense reporters, the sexy sounding words, we were just poor health reporters. And yes, TB Ridma is quite boring, no page one for you, sorry. I have heard that, that was being said on my face. So yes, oh, we, all of us faced all of it, yes. But what changed, thankfully? Now everybody in the newsroom is a health journalist and science journalist, so everybody has something or the other to contribute. So it's like, you know, now everybody wants, to, because the page one suddenly became important, so the stories were coming, Dr. Paul, Dr. Bhargava, there were these probably meetings, uh, press briefings happening every day, so everybody wanted to analyze that. WHO briefings people were attending, I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> which otherwise nobody would have even known exists. So that has changed. So the spotlight is back on health. And also, le let me just add that, the health budget suddenly has seen an increase, which otherwise I think health ministers year after year after year would go and say, we need some more money. You know, there is good research happening. So it's still a long, long way to go, but I think that has changed. So that disruption is something, and as Namita rightly said, it needs to continue. We need to sustain this, and we are here to communicate. So obviously, whatever is thrown at us, we'll try in a better way and in a safer way to put across. So that's our promise. But yes, things have changed, hopefully for good. One is that health is technical. And I think the previous session also brought out the fact that, you know, the language of people becomes very, very critical in terms of being able to communicate health and ensuring that they understand the right behaviors or the right actions that they need to take. And then I think this whole element of, you know, sessions such as this where you're actually bringing science close to communication in terms of we understand our research but we also need to be able to figure out how best to make sure that people understand it as well, especially the ones that need to understand, and, and the pandemic was such a crisis situation. 
But I want to first focus on one point that you mentioned, which was about the need to know who to reach out to. You know, there are these, um, the public health experts, people who understand data, people who are analyzing what's really happening on the ground. And if I may come to you, Sushmi, um, is there room to build these collaborations with public health experts, with, you know, creating these networks so that, that, you know, that fear, that barrier that Namita spoke about, that just starts to dissolve. Because like you said, Ritma, if there is room for us to build on that momentum, one of the key elements will be to create a relationship which is a positive, trusting relationship between scientists, between experts, and media. And media is not seen as this somebody out there looking for a sensational story only, right? Media is there to help us tell our story better. So any thoughts about creating such networks, building them, enabling them over a long term period so that, uh, you know, it can actually become a very trusting and positive relationship for the media ecosystem as a whole. So I think uh, the barrier has already been broken and that's why probably we are here. Uh, talking, having conversations, you know, like uh, one of my panelists mentioned that uh, we were kept away, you know, you don't understand science. So, th so that notion has, has broken. Now, this has to be sustained. This has to, now, you know, uh, even among, see, health journalists were, I think, uh, Maybe there were exception, exceptional situation, but uh, health journalists, health, health reporters were anyways communicating, were trying to uh, break that barrier. Uh, the trust building, relationship building exercises were, were going on. But what has happened now is that overall there is a, there is a ice breaking. So uh, now ICMR is known. Now, uh, 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 NIV is more talked about. Uh, I don't think my editors ever ever uh, knew what NIV does. Now, when when I when, now Entagi is being talked about. So when you say Entagi, the you know uh, it pops up. So, so what I'm saying is that jargons. You know, these were jargons earlier. Now they have become part of the or becoming part of the lingo. So now, uh, so this this is a, this has to be a continuous process. The communication, the like you have, you know, like doctors have continued medical education. Similarly, this, you know, journalistic medical education, <laughs> whatever you call it, this has to this communication, this conversation has to go on. There are several forums, there are several platforms already existing, and innovation in terms as the media also keep innovating. There are campaigns uh, like. Uh, you know, we ran a mask campaign, hand hygiene campaign, these kind of platforms go on. There are explainers, there are, uh, like Times of India has uh, le learning with times. So, you know, those kind of platforms which already exist, there are idea exchanges, there are uh, networking sessions, there are knowledge sharing workshops which are being conducted. and. Uh, uh, and there are many such. So this, these things have to continue. And um, I think especially when we talk about, see, there are primarily two, two verticals which has, how science has been reported so far. There's science reporting and there's public health reporting. So science reporting is something which is, uh, you report Lancet, you report ICMR journal papers. There are there are different papers and scientific studies uh, which are being or disease related things which are being reported, and there is this pure public health which includes policy also which is being reported. Now what pandemic has done is brought them together. So it this has simplified already. This simplification has to go further. That how does that Lancet paper really impacts the common man? You know, how, how is it going to impact the public health? What are the implications that are there? Once we are able to connect those dots, uh, I think uh, health will make it to headlines soon. आपसे एक दूसरा सवाल पूछना था नितिन जी जी एक्चुअली मैं आपसे ये जानना चाह रही थी कि जैसे आपने दूरदर्शन की बात की और आपने बोला कि थोड़ी रिस्पांसिबिलिटी एस ए पब्लिक ब्रॉडकास्टर बन जाती है बट 
द काइंड ऑफ ऑडियंस जो आपकी यू नो द रीच इज सो ह्यूज एंड यू हैव ऑडियंस ऑफ ऑल काइंड्स सो जैसे आपने बोला कि आपने एक्सप्लेनर वीडियोज़ भी बनाए और डेमोन्स्ट्रेशन वीडियोज भी लिए और बच्चों के वीडियोज एंड ऑल ऑफ दैट हेल्प मी अंडरस्टैंड कि ऑडियंस का रिस्पॉन्स आप लोग कैसे मैप करते हैं एंड हाउ डू यू देन चेंज द वे यू प्रजेंट योर स्टोरी बिकॉज यू हैव सच डिफरेंट एंड वेरीड ऑडियंस दैट यू केटर टू सो हेल्प अस अनपैक दैट जी बिल्कुल देखिए अभी काफ़ी कुछ बदलाव हो गया है टी वी के अलावा लोग सोशल मीडिया पर ज़्यादा हैं चाहे वो ट्विटर हो इंस्टाग्राम अभी तो सबसे ज़्यादा हिट है रील इतने बन रहे हैं कि सब लोग रील ही बना रहे हैं तो यंगस्टर तो पूरे रील में ही मस्त हैं और फेसबुक है तो हम लोगों ने भी चेंज किया है अपने आप को अगर हम दूरदर्शन पे अपने अगर कोई कार्यक्रम दिखा रहे हैं या न्यूज़ दिखा रहे हैं या बुलेटिन है तो वो यूट्यूब पे ट्वीट भी होता है यूट्यूब के लिंक उसमें शेयर होते हैं फेसबुक पर भी जाता है इंस्टाग्राम पर भी जाता है रील भी बन रहा है और कम्युनिकेशन के थोड़ा सा और स्टाइल चेंज किए कि अगर यूथ है तो वो कैसे अट्रैक्ट होंगे तो विजुअल के साथ ग्राफिक्स डेढ़ से एक मिनट डेढ़ मिनट का या फिर पिक के साथ पिक्चर के साथ ग्राफिक्स अट्रैक्ट करने के लिए ताकि इंस्टाग्राम पे जाए लोग मोबाइल पे देख सकें तो एक तो ये बदलाव आया व्यूवर्स का आप कर, पूछ रहे थे कि कैसे लोग लोगों की बात आप समझते हैं हम ग्राउंड में जाते हैं हम लोगों से बाइट लेते हैं बात करते हैं तो वो बहुत कुछ बोलते हैं कुछ चीज़ें दिखाते कुछ नहीं दिखाते हैं वो इसलिए नहीं दिखाते कि वो बहुत नाराज़ होते हैं अब 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 छोटी सी बात है लोग कह रहे थे कि वैक्सीन लगाने के बाद भी तो इन्फेक्शन हो जा रहा है ये सबसे बड़ा सवाल था तो उसको कैसे एड्रेस करिएगा तो हम लोगों ने सवाल चार बजे के सर के प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस में पूछते थे कि भाई वैक्सीन के बाद भी इन्फेक्शन हो रहा है तो स्टडी हुई एन पुणे में जो ब्रेक थ्रू इन्फेक्शन और ये सब हो रहा था तो फिर आया कि भाई संक्रमण तो होगा लेकिन आप गंभीर रूप से बीमार नहीं होंगे आप अस्पताल में भर्ती नहीं होंगे और वैक्सीन अगर आप लगाते हैं तो आप मास्क भी लगाइए दो गज की दूरी का भी पालन करिए साथ ही साथ हाथ भी धोइए ये लगातार आप बोल रहे थे तो हम लोग जो डॉक्टर स्पीक हमारा शो होता था तो हम फोन इन कार्यक्रम भी करते थे उस दौरान कि डायरेक्ट सर भी मेरे ख्याल से बैठे होंगे कई बार और लोग पूछते हैं सवाल डॉक्टर हमारे पैनल पर हैं लाइव जुड़े हुए हैं एंकर से जुड़े हुए हैं तो वो पूछते हैं डायरेक्ट सवाल उनके मन में जो होता है और एक्सपर्ट जवाब उसके देते हैं तो हम बीवर का हमारे पास डायरेक्ट फीडबैक आता है अकॉर्डिंग वही हम सवाल भी करते थे प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस में सरकार से भी आईसीएमआर से भी जितने भी एक्सपर्ट थे तो वो उसका जवाब मिलता था अब छोटा सा एग्जाम्पल एक और दूंगा प्लाज्मा प्लाज्मा एक बड़ा इशू बना हुआ था अब शुरू में हुआ कि प्लाज्मा के सेंटर खुल रहे थे प्लाज्मा डोनेट करो फिर बाद में हुआ कि डॉक्टर प्राइवेट में लिखने लगे प्लाज्मा लोग मारा मारी करने लगे प्लाज्मा के लिए कि भाई कहाँ से लाया जाए हम लोग के पास भी पर्सनल कॉल आते थे फिर ये एन पुणे ने आई थिंक स्टडी किया कि प्लाज्मा से कोई फ़ायदा नहीं है बाद में प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस में भी पूछा जाने लगा जवाब आया कि भाई प्लाज्मा से कोई फ़ायदा नहीं उस तरफ आप ना जाए तो ये डायरेक्ट इन्फॉर्मेशन मिलता है इसी विषय में देन माई क्वेश्चन टू यू रिदमा इज दिस होल एलिमेंट ऑफ मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन बिकॉज क्या हुआ ड्यूरिंग द पैंडेमिक बिकॉज ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट थिंग्स वर सो डायनेमिक इज वेल एंड हेल्थ लाइक वी ऑल सेट इज अ टेक्निकल सब्जेक्ट सो मे बी पीपल डोंट अंडरस्टैंड इट एज ईजीली देर वॉज अ लॉट ऑफ दिस मिस इन्फॉर्मेशन डूइंग द राउंड एंड बोथ इन टर्म्स ऑफ हैविंग टू पुट आउट न्यूज एवरी डे दैट प्रेशर प्लस ऑल्सो द फैक्ट दैट इज ऑल ऑफ दिस यू नो अज्यूम्ड इन्फॉर्मेशन दैट्स कमिंग आउट and being lapped up on social media so readily and we've all seen the whatsapp university doing its rounds yes, totally so on an overdrive during exactly. the exactly so how does then one manage to make sure that one the health message is clear on target daily and you're also addressing this really big uh, you know giant of fake news that's all over the place Uh, see for me it's like obviously speed is of paramount importance there is no denying that we live in a time when fastest finger first is actually a reality you know there was a time when deadlines uh, hourly deadlines were for tv not for print but now we have websites so you know which website is breaking first the news first so obviously but then i also understand that if you are first and you are wrong then you're not first at all because then we have those deleted tweets or probably stories pulled down no point doing that so there is no uh, shortcut to 
checking, cross-checking multiple times if you have doubts. So the real way to counter this is to get to the right people, reach out to the right people. As uh, Namita also pointed out in the beginning, that you know we should know who to get in touch with. So personally, I have chewed everyone's brain, starting from people at ICMR, Health Ministry, AIMS, PGI Chandigarh, I have gone everywhere, called up at 10, 11 in the night when there has been some information, because even small little information gets blown up. So, and when it gets blown up, so the health reporter gets called because all the other experts fail in the newsroom. They can copy paste as much, but not more than that. So there is no shortcut to cross-checking multiple times, even if it means you have to hold, up, hold on to the uh, information for a while, but there is no other way. You can't go wrong, especially se health. It, it, sensationalization is nothing but putting out wrong information, because most of the time when that gets clarified, so you realize, oh, it's not that big a thing. And we have seen it with community transmission. You know that everybody was so big on it. But the health ministry just went, took its time. Nahi hai, nahi hai, no community transmission. <laughs> so, aaj tak nahi hai, actually. <laughs> so, it, it never, we never had COVID co in community, so that's okay. But the thing is, we uh, have to be responsible. So, no shortcuts there. Absolutely. And I know. <laughs> I know we're running out of time, but I have one last question for you, Namita. You spoke about uh, India's vaccine story, and I do want to bring out that fact in terms of the opportunity and the responsibility of media to ensure that the right messages also reach the global stage, right? And again, social media plays a big role in terms of just sort of, you know, elevating a lot of the misinformation out there as well. How then do we ensure that we are connected with the right global stakeholders as well? We also get the global voices every now and then to get the right messages, especially when you know we are talking about almost reaching, for example, a two billion vac vaccine mark. I mean, India has done incredibly on the vaccine bit. So how do we make sure that we carry on that positive messaging globally? So um, I'll just... Uh, uh, start with the fact that um, what we are doing with the conversation in India is essentially taking Indian research to the global audience. So uh, just uh, sort of tweaking what you said. And uh, the b I mean, the biggest challenge in doing that, in getting, you know, indigenous research, uh, Indian research, science, technology, etc., to a global audience, what is uh, you know going to say uh, researcher prof slash profess professor X Y Z and saying, sir, why don't you write this great amazing piece for a million audience in U S U K Australia everywhere on vaccine, sir? You write it. You are an expert. You know the drill. You write it, and um, the reaction comes. Uh, ye peer reviewed hai. No, sir, this is for the lay audience. Okay, will it count as a publication? No, sir, it won't count as a publication. You are doing this in the interest of public health messaging. So then Professor XYZ says, okay, fine, since you've been after my life and you're saying all these big things and all these lovely audiences are going to come to me, I will write it. And there is a long... Uh, essay on vaccines um, and the editor gets to work uh, so actually our brief is it has to uh, make sense to a 16 year old stu person what i cannot write for a 16 year old person that is dumbing down my research so this is the main challenge in getting research work uh, you know, to, to a lay audience and bridging that kind of gap. Now, uh, the, the minute you talk about a global audience, then you have to ensure that there is, you know, the story is simplified for them. So, you know, everyone knows what, what the situation of TB in India is and so on. But they don't know that. So we have to begin the story from the beginning. So what is TB? 
the history of TB control program in India, where did it start from, and so on. So that that kind of you know uh, working with with uh, with the researchers with the experts is i think it's a work in progress but i also want to say that there is a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, positivity or a lot of um, uh, enthusiasm in researchers i mean we are sitting uh, at the risk of repeating myself we are sitting here and having this conversation but a lot of experts also want to write they see all this garbage that comes in social media and they're like hey what are you writing this is not making sense this is incorrect so they also want to do this they accept that they um, they they don't know where to go uh, which platform to uh, which platform is accessible to them which platform will actually work with them to uh, you know to ensure that they are seeing what they are seeing is retained the essence is retained the fact is retained so what we do is we tell them that a we are not into rhetoric or polemics we are not going to talk about opinion we are going to talk about facts and every line that they say india has x cases of dengue has to be um, uh, has to be qualified so we hyperlink it to their research so some uh, supposing uh, dr rajnikanth is writing a paper uh, uh, an article and uh, dr rajnikanth is not looking very pleased <laughs> but uh, so if he is writing an article maybe he has written about you know um, some public health issue in gorakhpur and he can reference it to that what does do, what that does is he doesn't have to go into the specifics he can uh, or, you know do away with the jargon and the audience also can check that okay if they want to read more so they go to that so that's uh, if that so answers your question there's a there's a way that we figured out at least in some of these instances but clearly some progress and obviously lots of opportunities but maybe also room for some learning and capacity building at both ends both in terms of media's understanding of the health and science domain more effectively more efficiently more continuously and for science to be able to break down those jargons and technical terms and barriers and be more um, open and more available for media and for writing in general great session i know we don't have time for q and a at this stage but thank you everyone for participating and thank you so much to my panelists lovely having this discussion here thank you Thank you so much, Pooja. And thank you to our panelists. Uh, you know, we're three and a half hours and going, and you still managed to keep us all uh, quite engaged with your uh, with your real stories. Absolutely. I hope this uh, meeting today will go for one step further in bridging the gap. And so we progress with our agenda.
circa 35,600 BC at Altamira, Spain, a wise man became speculative. He wanted to document his surroundings, daily life, and struggles for the sake of posterity. Till then, he could communicate only through sound and body language. The Paleolithic man contemplated and then started painting with charcoal on the cave walls and left imprints of his palms to record his existence. This was the onset of primitive man's journey in visual communication. In 1839, the year that is marked as the birth of the photographs, another wise man desired to document and communicate matters of medicine and science, again for posterity. His name was Alfred Francois Dawn, a public health physician in Paris. He too started painting like his prehistoric procedure but not with charcoal or paints. He painted with light on specially prepared glass plates to produce real life images, not interpreted artistic illustrations. Alfred Dawn pioneered visual documentation of medicine with photomicrographs of Trichomonas vaginalis and 85 other themes from hematology and oncology including leukemia. This was the onset of man's journey in medical and scientific photography to document and communicate about medicine and science. Very good evening to everyone. My name is Koshik Ghosh. I'm a physician turned medical photographer and I am documenting the intertwined relationship between man and medicine. The journey that started with surgery, but later continued with public health. Each photograph of mine is a document written with light. I'm not an artist, I'm a documentarian. Medicine and science are stark realities to me. I'm documenting history by freezing fleeting moments of time and truth in my photographs. I'm a visual storyteller of medicine and humanity. Both medicine and photography taught me the five principles of narrative. Observe, listen, acknowledge, assimilate, interpret, and act. I'm communicating the first cardinal and integral part of clinical medicine through my photographs, the history of the person. Like public health and medicine, my images are also incomplete without people. I specifically have two objectives while visually communicate health sciences. One, I want to capture and exhibit things that ought to be rectified or amended. Two, I want to capture and exhibit things that require appreciation. These are the operative methods in which I want my photographs to communicate visually. Now, the algorithm of this expressive process involves each photograph adhering to the four S of public health communication that actually I have learned from my mentor of public health who is sitting right here and who taught me the public health, Niti Kriti, Dr. Rajshankar Ghosh. The first S is simple. Photography is a universal language. It needs no translation. It doesn't need literacy. The second ace is straightforward. Communicative messages embedded in photographs are candid and clear. There are no ambiguity, obliqueness, or complexity in a frame. The third ace is short or brief, because photography is a symbolic language. This lingua unequivocally depicts the what, 
why, how, and where a situation or a moment within a single frame. And often, expositions is unnecessary. And the fourth and final ace is sincere or truthful. The camera never lies. It captures a real moment, honestly, once and all. A photograph doesn't interpret or embellish, unlike a sketch or painting. Veracity is the hallmark of the medium of photography. And finally, each photograph reflects the ideology of the photographer. The mood question is every photograph that follows the forest of communication poisoned or impactful? I personally try to amalgamate the principle of 2E in my photographs to ensure incorporation of forests in each photograph, though they are very much individual perspectives. The first ace is equality. I feel that the entire human race is one. Each global citizen has the equal rights for health, education, and food, notwithstanding differences in color, ethnicity, language, culture, and socioeconomic inequalities. Human emotions and reactions are identical. As a photographer, whenever or and wherever it is possible, I embrace, incorporate, and portray this message of equality in my frames. And the second and the most important E is empathy. It is the person in the photograph who creates the narrative, not the photographer. Hence, when I am photographing an individual, I consciously preserve his or her dignity. I document the individual, his or her ambience, joy, sorrow, sufferings, without tinting the frame with my prejudice or bias that is not to be confused with my emotional quotient with empathy. Following Paul Bloom's advice in his amazing book, Against Empathy, The Case of Rational Compassion, I'm trying to be as much as honest to my subjects to make the photograph rationally human. I'd like to conclude by saying that it is unnecessary to get appreciated for light, tonality, color in a photograph Rather, it is vital to inform the people to provoke a debate, discuss the problem together, and come up with a solution. This invites, involves the common man to be an integral component of the discourse and dialogue. This process induces him or her to be concerned on reading the photograph. I want people to see think, reflect, and interpret the photographs. The citizen needs to feel with mind and soul what each photograph represents. Since its advent, photography, silent yet verbose, two-dimensional and motionless images, has become the omnipotent medium of visual communication. Photography is the collective cultural memory of the world Photography immortalizes moments of time. These crystallized moments then metamorphose into symbols and references. This collage of symbols and references creates a harshly honest mirror in which our society can constantly observe itself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Ghosh, for sharing uh, those powerful images with us. And uh, uh, a picture is indeed worth a thousand words. Um, they tell us so many stories that perhaps you were trying to tell us and uh, allowed us to read our own as well. So I'd like to call uh, Kaushik Bose to please felicitate Mr. Ghosh.
And now to this wonderful audience, uh, to our last session, uh, last but definitely not the least. Um, our previous session had an excellent segue at the end uh, that you know really set the stage for this one. Uh, we're going to be talking about the future, science and health storytelling through new media. And um, we've had a very exciting day, and uh, I think this last conversation is really going to close it out well. We're going to look at how social media can be, as we talked about, not just our best friend, but perhaps sometimes our worst foe as well. And in today's day and age, how, does digital, how do digital platforms uh, catalyze um, conversations on science and uh, healthcare and storytelling and really bridge the gap that we were talking about between uh, the scientists and uh, the common man or woman? So uh, without further ado, I would like to call uh, Mr. Syed Nazakat, the founder and CEO of uh, Data Leads, a, data media, a digital media and information initiative that helps people understand and engage with the world around them. And uh, the Data Leads team has been doing excellent work uh, uh, for a long time now on helping actually simplify uh, complex data into more easier and simpler stories. Uh, Dr. Shantanu Ganguly, who is the Chief Librarian at uh, the All India Institute for Medical Sciences in Delhi and has extensive experience in information and knowledge management. And finally, Ms. Uh, Payal, Ms. Payal Kamath, who works in public policy and the government division of Twitter India. And to moderate this session, we have Mr. Tamseel Hussain, a fantastic storyteller in his own right and the CEO and founder at People Like Us Create, a platform that empowers content creators to share powerful stories. I think it should be them. But before we actually start, uh, I'd like um, I'd like our colleagues from ICMR, Dr. Rana and Dr. Priya, to please, uh, and of course, uh, Mirza Shadan, to help felicitate uh, our panelists. <laughs> Mr. Tamseel Hussain. Ms. Payal Kamath. Mr. Syed Nazakat. And Dr. Shantanu Ganguly. Um, so first of all, I know it's the last panel, um, but I want to start with one question, right? And that question is for all of us. And they're going to be a collection of actually three questions followed by one after another, right? The first question, that's something that all of us know, right? Has anyone over here read or connected with misinformation on social media? You could just do this, right? Yay, nay. That's it. There have to be more, okay? Second question. Have we tried to counter misinformation? I'll give an example. What's the source? Simple question. That's it? Wow, two people. Okay, here's a tricky one. Okay, and I'm... <laughs> okay, here's a tricky one, okay? Have we shared it? Have we shared fake news by mistake from our person on WhatsApp, on anything else? No one, by mistake, nothing, and then you deleted it. No, wow. I think I'm, uh, <laughs> I think we're in a very interesting room today, right? Okay, and I'm gonna follow up a question with the panelists. What are some of the most interesting health fake news things that you might have actually seen 
on your profiles, on your platforms, or something else. Anything you would like to share. Something which is so interesting and bizarre. I'll give an example. I, I actually found this as a fake news that, I think it was, oh, I don't remember it now, I've lost the train of thought, but I'm gonna start with the panelists. Say, would you like to go first? Oh yeah, okay, uh, just for a background actually, and uh, thank you so much, and really pleasure to being here. I really enjoyed the conversation and the session before it. Uh, it's quite a learning to see the conversation is happening around communication and misinformation. We run one of the world's biggest network of educators, scientists, technologists, and journalists which fight misinformation in almost 40 countries. And I can give a simple example on, there was a video circulating on one social media platform and it had millions and millions of views and the video was a black virgin cow urine can cure cancer. And that was one thing. But if you look at the comments under that video, which were more harmful, actually people were asking, where can we get this? Is it branded somewhere? We can get, in, uh, get treated for it. And we did a research with Google uh, during the COVID-19, what people search online and what that tells us. But I will share that maybe in the second half and why that is so important for us. Thank you. And, and that shows how dangerous misinformation really is. Dr. Gangli. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, during pandemic period, I was not with AIMS, I was with Tata Energy Research Institute, Terry, and I organized uh, a webinar at that time on misinformation. One of the two, one, one thing I came across which was very interesting at that time is, what is exactly the meaning of infodemic? I was trying to look into. And actual, the WHO definitions were there, and based on that, I conducted, along with the United Nations, I conducted a program exclusively on misinformation. And some of the speakers from the uh, different countries, parts of the world, they flooded in to really talk about misinformation. One of the speakers, they have shown a very interesting thing, that there is a tool to measure the misinformation also. And they are extensively used that application to measure the misinformation also. Interesting. Um, Bail, would you have anything you want to add here? Anything? Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's more of a personal anecdote, yeah. but I guess when um, vaccination, was, vaccination drive was on uh, full swing, um, you know, things about women menstruating shouldn't get a vaccine, shouldn't get vaccine doses, or when they are, uh, you know, due to, on their periods, I think that was one of, uh, the misinformation I saw floating around and that personally affected I think people like me and you know my friends and family immediate family asking is this true and you know like literally calling up doctors to understand if that was true but yeah definitely if I can add one interesting situation that happened and that went viral if we all remember in the first wave when there was a lot of violence against doctors being done um, because of misinformation that they are spreading COVID. And we had a lot of creators on ground who actually faced this violence. And it spread because of misinformation and there was no way to control it on ground. But let's start with the first question, right? Pyle, this one's for you. What do you think are the biggest hurdles, right? That you, as someone from the public policy team of Twitter, as a social media platform, you face during a public health crisis, right? Especially health misinformation that happens and also the opportunities. Yeah, thanks Tamsil and thank you everyone um, and congratulations to ICMR for hosting this. Um, so yes, so when you look at a product um, and especially a global social media product, um, you see, uh, you know, there are two ways you look at misinformation, uh, especially in the age of open internet. Uh, how do you look at misinformation is, you know, things that come online uh, through, through hearsay or things that start cropping up and start trending on the platform. Um, so you do see uh, you know, channels of misinformation sprouting. How does a technology platform tackle it? There are two ways to look at it. One is policy and one is product in itself. So all social media platforms, and I can speak for Twitter, had what we did uh, when the pandemic hit uh, ASAP was, you know, to kind of see how we can work first on the product itself. Uh, and when we say product, and even now, if those of you who use Twitter, um, if you open your Twitter app right now, you will still see a COVID-19 hub 
on your Explore tab, and we've not taken it down. Uh, that hub was created so that relevant and credible information is surfaced. And what do we mean by relevant and credible information? Information from health authorities, information from scientists, information from experts, uh, information from public health organizations globally, uh, and uh, you know governments locally. So we created this hub so that relevant information is surfaced. It's discoverable for our users in multiple languages so that they know where to find the relevant information. So that's one step of educating people. The other thing that we also worked on simultaneously is building policies to tackle misinformation. So we have a COVID misinformation policy, a COVID vaccine misinformation policy. What does this mean? People spreading misinformation about COVID uh, when reported or when picked up by our system via machine learning, and uh, we, th there was machine learning involved, uh, when there is misinformation spread, that is that, account, that misinformation either is fact-checked, corrected, or is taken down. So, you know, we apply labels saying that this information is disputed, or, you know, there is a label that is applied that says that global health authorities dispute this information. So, so why this is critical and why the role of so many scientists and experts was important for Twitter is because it was their um, tweets, it was the content that they were putting up, it was the content journalists that, you know, that had access to health authorities were putting up, became important for us to tackle misinformation. Apart from that, there were a lot many product features that was introduced, including, and I want to focus specifically on APIs, because we are, we are talking about technology and you know future of technologies. Twitter has open APIs that people can use to develop tools. And during the second wave of COVID, um, it almost humbles up to, uh, humbles to feel, uh, you know, to say that, you know, we were almost used like a lifeline. Uh, so during the second wave of COVID, Twitter APIs were used by developers to build tools that surfaced relevant information. So whether it is where, uh, where is oxygen available, where is you know, um, hospital beds available. Uh, so these APIs were accessed by developers across India to build tools. So these were some of the ways we supported and um, you know, happy to speak about it in the next question or next segment. Definitely, yeah. I, th I think just for everyone, if you were to explain what APIs are, that would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. So uh, APIs are basically the back end of data uh, for Twitter that you know, if you are a developer, you make a request, uh, and if your request is for good, in the sense like, you know, like for during COVID time, it was, or, or it is for academic reasons, Twitter gives you access to its APIs. So you can use those APIs, that back end data, to kind of build tools to aggregate information. To, to get, uh, you know, certain insights that can then help you, uh, you know, relay that information back to users. So, for example, during second wave, people were constantly talking about, there is a hospital bed available here, there are oxygens available there, I'm here to help, I can provide meals, I can do this, but it was spread all across, right? So, how do you kind of support it? So, you open up APIs, developers build tools, with those tools, people are able to, like, for example, there was, um, COVID, uh, you know, India cares dot in that was helped, uh, you know, built during using COVID uh, APIs, a Twitter APIs. What happens is that tool pulls material and then in the back end matches uh, donors versus donees, right? Uh, it matches people who say that okay, I need a bed in Muzaffar Nagar, and you know, it kind of picks up tweets that is talking about that and then matches. So those are the different ways, uh, you know, APIs can be used to kind of build tools. Thank you so much, Pal. And also, I think the COVID hub on Twitter was my source of getting the right information. Even as Pluck, we were constantly checking that. So that was amazing the way it was done. Sayed, if I might ask, if I may ask a question, right? You, Data Leads is a partner of Google News Initiative, right? And you train journalists on how to combat misinformation. And if you were to inform everyone what strategies were being used there, and have you seen a transition, transformation that has happened? Um, obviously, the audience is, yeah. does not share misinformation. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. uh, thank you so much for asking this, actually. My, I think, okay, it was uh, much before, I think it was 2015, uh, when we realized, actually, that, and I was uh, so happy that the, the, uh, the senior journalists before our session, they pointed it out, 
the health was never a priority in newsroom. It was always national security, foreign affairs and all. The best journalists will cover these affairs. And I cover national security for about 15 years, and including the prime minister's office. And I came back to health after that because my wife is a doctor. And I thought like, okay, let's do something which will be some a game changing platform here. 2015, we brought 20 scientists, doctors, and 20 journalists together on a workshop. We called it Data Bootcamp, 2015. And my fear was the doctors will not come for this workshop because they're busy, full day workshop, commitment is a huge commitment. To my surprise, they all were there for that one day. And that gave us a first sense that there is a possibility of building collaboration between two different domain expertise in the room. We took that learning to 17 Asian countries, to Hong Kong, to Malaysia, to Philippines, to Thailand, to India, to Sri Lanka. It became a huge, uh, you know, kind of a network. That was around 2018. And Google approached us and said, hey, what you're doing is beautiful. Will you like to take to another level where we can do mass enhancing of skills at a very different level? We're talking about one billion people in the country. How can you train so many people in so many languages, so many states? So we said, okay, we have a solution. Let's try something. So we designed something, uh, what we said, it was a, a fact-checking TOT training of trainers. We selected, out of 5,000 applications across the country, we selected 250 professors, media educators, editors, journalists, and we trained them at five different locations for five days. Those people went back. They did training across India in 20 languages at more than 700 universities, 5,000 newsrooms. It became the world's biggest network to enhance the skills. And what were they training people on? Very simple tools. And a lot of people were actually surprised. The tools are so simple. I can learn them in five minutes and stop misinformation and kind of fake news, quote, unquote. The tool was how to verify a false image. And the tool was Google reverse image. It takes you just 10 minutes to learn it. Another tool, Invid. It takes you half an hour to learn it. How to, how to identify a doctored video. And people actually were surprised these tools are so simple to learn. Why were not we using it? And in that ecosystem, we took to another level, which is called a factual. If you Google it, you will have a full website there. We thought, let us train everyone. It's not only about the fake news, misinformation is not the problem of journalism or media. It's a whole society approach. Everyone is responsible and has to take decisions. So we did the same exercise with community leaders, with thought leaders, with uh, community radio stations. We selected 70 community radio stations across the country. And that was 2018 when India had hardly four or five fact checkers. Today. India has the highest representation at the global level, what we call IFC and signatories. India has the highest IFC and signatories, and each one got benefited from this training. So this program is running from last five years. Google is the key partner in this Google News Initiative. And at Data Leads, we are running actually a next phase, just in next month, that applications are out. We're selecting 100 professors, journalists, editors, all across India again. So the key is, and I will close on that, and this is, which is very important, and I, I always make sure that I, I underline it. For the first time in the human history, we have more information than we are able to consume. Journalists were trained by practice how to collect information, how to collect quotes, how to meet people. So that was how we were trained. But our problem today is there's too much information available. And now the, our challenge remains how to make sense of this information for people. I think that's huge, and it needs a different skill set. How do you use social media? How do you understand what people are searching? And to us in this room, uh, you, in most of uh, you may be aware about it, health is the most searched word on Google. Everyone searches, it's the most searched word on the Google. And we did one year long research along with 10 doctors, what people search on Google, and Google gave us access to something called Google Hub. Whatever search you make, it goes to a Google Hub, and they gave us access for a year. And for us, it was looking at the future. What people really hide, even from doctors, what they want to talk, they want to be comfortable about their mental health. And that gave us a sense also, a lot of misinformation circulates 
because there's no information available. So I think it's like a very fundamental shift happening in the larger global information landscape where we do not have people who have the skills to understand how to survive. And that's perhaps why also the WHO is making sure that the future doctors will have a one subject about behavioral science, about fact checking, online verification. They created a course called uh, Infodemic Management Course and we were consulting them actually on that. And 750 doctors in the world have taken that course. And we as a company are starting a global course in a couple of months which will be available for doctors all across the world on infodemic management. Great. Um, thank you, Sayed. Um, Dr. Gangli, as someone who's been leading knowledge management systems across various organizations, any insight as someone who's working for AIMS now and earlier with Terry, misinformation, how does it affect, how does it affect the institution? How, what learnings can we share here? Because it's coming from a perspective of a, a different side, right? Yeah. See, one of the important component as far as the knowledge management system is concerned, and I have been implementing game systems in, across India. In fact, I have worked for National Action Plan for Climate Change and also State Action Plan for Climate Change, and they are submitting their thing. See, the most important, there are three critical factors as far as the, uh, any knowledge management system is implementation is concerned. And when, even in AIMS also, I'm looking at something called as a research information management system where every researcher is working, every faculty is working on different area. I'm getting into the deep into those areas. But these three critical factors are people, process, and technology. It is in short form, we call it PPT. One of the important component of knowledge management system, which I came across, uh, I'll, I mean, we, since morning we have been talking a lot about COVID, one of the important component and one of the key thing of a knowledge management system is what is called as lessons learned. It is extremely important today to capture the lessons learned. And that is where we make a blunder mistake if we don't capture the lessons learned. I'll just give you a small example. There was a study done by the KM team of World Bank. It was a problem with Tanzania there was a, a tremendous problem where a lot of children were dying because of uh, malnutrition problem and especially with respect to milk. Milk was not there. And there was a lot of problem with the cows which were there. So they were not able to you know, extract out the milk in a proper way. Process were not followed and all. So World Bank did a complete study on that. What they have done, they kept on looking for where is the lessons learned who has done the best model or the best practice captured for as far as the milk is concerned. You know who, which example they have taken? National Dairy Development Board. This National Dairy Development Board, the entire lesson was captured and today Tanzania is following that model. So it is extremely important in today's context, we should capture the lessons, what we have learned. Do you have any lessons from health misinformation? That I captured? Well, uh, I'll tell you, there was a very interesting example. It was not like a misinformation, I would say. Uh, I was working with the, you know, Madhya Pradesh government for uh, implementation of game system once more. And uh, we had the principal secretaries and everybody we were doing and all. So we were, you know, we had a climate change, uh, I mean, climate scientists were there, a lot of geographic and edaphic scientists were there with us. I was a part of one of the team leaders of the knowledge management system and all. So what came up that there was a particular place in Madhya Pradesh, we were trying to look at the water gradient level. So a lot of you know, climate scientists and all, they were using uh, some applications and they were showing a lot of experimentations and saying that we will get a certain amount of water on this particular place. There was a, ch there was a problem with the measurement so the information was wrong. So the, the bunch of, uh, you know, the villagers who were there, they had got a very strong ability to sense and they touch the soil and they can say that this particular place have got a water availability reservoir at the down. And they completely changed the information and the principal secretary said, I think we should go back and find out the research 
repeat it once more to find out exactly what has actually happened. Well, that's that's a very interesting story, and also by and it, it it was a live example with me. And also, it's a very I love that story, and also a great uh, moment to change the gears. Yeah, bit. and I'll I'll just highlight a one more yeah. component. Uh, this because I have been working. I was working with the you know uh, this Uttarakhand government on you know in 2015 there was a huge disaster, and you know the because of the that uh, cloud burst, the entire portion of the thing. So World Bank funded a very big project to us, so I was one of the team leader for implementation of game system and social media system for them. So when we visited to different places to collect the data, in fact, I have developed a vulnerability index also for the uh, Uttarakhand government. So when we started there and looking into the details and all, lot of people were passing misinformation to us. But at that particular moment, when we, See, it is, we need to find out the source, from which source this information is coming. And that's very important. Unless and until we validate the source, we cannot rely on it. That's, that's a very, very important information. Yes. So we also have five minutes, and I want to ask a really important question. And I'm switching gears from misinformation, right? And the question I want to ask, Pyle, we know that science and research Twitter, I mean, as we can see, we have a lot of Twitter users here, right? And science and uh, research Twitter is something which is coming up. And after COVID, it became a really, really big thing. Is there anything that Twitter is doing to champion this? And what are, uh, what are the things that we can expect as the audience? Thanks, Samseel. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, because yes, we are, I mean, I think pandemic, um, and even now with monkeypox, uh, you know, we've been seeing information sharing worldwide and consumption worldwide uh, based on health expert uh, you know kind of uh, information sharing so what we've seen is our users constantly went to health experts for credible information um, they went to scientist profiles they went to doctor profiles they went to health journalists profile to get that credible information so what what are the product features? I mean, for COVID, of course, we developed a lot of product features where we had a search prompt which could surface relevant information. We had SOS pages. We had COVID hub, like I spoke about. But there are different products that Twitter in itself is developing. Like, for example, a lot of you who use Twitter must have seen recently there's something called topics. You get suggested topics, right? Um, you can actually see that you know there is a topic for science and technology. There is a topic for health. There is a topic for COVID-19, of course, but the health and science and technology topic in general um, actually surfaces information from health experts for users. So I follow that topic uh, because you know it, it actually gives me uh, expert advice from globally, right? And things that I probably couldn't have accessed otherwise. I wouldn't know uh, people unless I had to search for their profile. But now I have to just follow a topic and I get their information. Right? Uh, there are lists that are on Twitter. Again, something that gets recommended to users. Uh, you can follow lists of scientists, lists of scientists in India, lists of scientists and doctors in India uh, globally. So you, there are actually these product features. Apart from that, of course, there is this product feature called Spaces. Um, I don't know how many of you have used it, but uh, if you follow Spaces and if you follow to a topic within Spaces saying that I'm interested in health-related uh, Spaces, you'll actually see amazing, uh, you know, Spaces is like an audio podcast, and you actually see so many health-related podcasts happening almost every day, people talking about um, different, uh, you know, healthcare priorities, uh, from fitness to, to actual, uh, you know, scientific research, and there is a whole community on Twitter, and uh, there are people who are passionate about it, there are people who follow it, and Twitter is building products for, for interest-based conversation, and that is how we are growing. And again, this is in different languages. It is not only in English. It is in India, it is in almost eight to nine languages. So yes. And yes, and I mean, I think I would love to see like some of the biggest influencers on social media to come from here in this room. It should be health, it should be scientists, it should be various people. One of my favorite Twitter spaces is um, a Friday mental health session with Dr. Samir Parikh. Um, and it's amazing. You could just like log in and you can hear a lot of amazing conversations that happen. 
Uh, Sayed, if I might ask a question, right? And this is what, with the amount of visual channels and digital platforms for news and information consumption, and, and it's increasing, and it's not just about regular social media platforms, right? You have a lot of regional apps that are coming up in India. You have so many various platforms coming up in India. Have you seen that there's a change in data-driven news reporting within that realm? Have you seen there's a shift that's happening? And if so, what is it that we can expect going forward? And what are the practices we can follow to see data-driven news yeah, reporting? No, I think uh, there are a couple of uh, courses or a couple of competencies which are really 21st century competencies. I think if I, if I list them very quickly, I feel like having a critical thinking skill is fundamental for everyone. Visual literacy is fundamentally important. Really, people do not get it, how they can be misled by colors, numbers, shapes. And it's a very interesting subject. And we don't see this discussion often happening uh, among a lot of people who cover it. And data, I believe, uh, is going to be, of course, the, like everything is digital. Even though we came for this room, we put numbers, emails, everything. We gave so many data points just for this particular session today. So I see a lot of data. Imagine just for a thought, half of India is on internet as of now. Remaining half of India will come on the internet in the next four or five years. So the digital footprint will be amazingly high. So it, is, it, it has a huge insight for us to understand what could happen in the future. But I seriously believe that, you know, all the medical colleges across the country, particularly I, I, journalists, of course, they do their own upcycling and other stuff. But I feel like the doctors, the way they study medicine in medical colleges, they need to think of how to communicate better, how to essentially read messages much better way. Sometimes your campaign, you you fails, healthcare campaign fails not because of default, but because uh, it's communication thing at the ground actually. Yeah, you're not able to see that happening. I think it becomes very critical for doctors to be really communicating better. And, and we've seen it already happening, that change happening. I've got a slip that says time's up, so I'm going to do a last. I got two, actually, five minutes, and I said time's up, wrap up the session. So the last question, right, Dr. Gangli, following up on this, right, this trend, if you were to say how can doctors communicate better? and grow, right, on social media and really spread the information that needs to be spread. Have you seen a trend of experts rising? What would that be? Well, thanks for asking this question. In fact, I am trying my level best to do it in Ames. Constantly, I am interacting with my, uh, my beloved doctors. And especially, I conduct a programs on, you know, how to communicate and all, and a lot of scholarly communications and all. Well, they are very expert in writing best of the research papers which gets published in highly impact factor journals and all. But in fact, writing a small story or maybe a paragraph, it's a challenge. In fact, I would like to mention that we have subscribed to one of the uh, very powerful database called uh, British Medical Journal, and they have come up with a very interesting module called Research to Publications. And now we are conducting, in fact, I have developed a model called, uh, a program called Health Information Literacy. And under that health information literacy, I am uh, asking the, you know, my doctors to my JRSR and all to do a lot of, you know, participate, complete that course. It is a 56 module course and they get a certification from British Medical Journal. That's what I'm trying my level best. Well, best of luck for that. And I think doctors telling stories is the future. Um, just to conclude the panel, I think one of the biggest things we've seen, uh, we've learned today is about how there's a trend of more and more health professionals using social media. I think we've seen from COVID how a lot of us wanted to follow individual health experts to get the right information, to understand health much better. So there's a massive need for more and more science and research communicating to the masses directly, and that's a huge shift that we're all going through. Thank you so much, um, and thank you to the panelists for really coming in, and I really hope you enjoy your, the rest of your evening.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you to all panelists for these insights into the expansive world of new media. I am now taking over from here. I would like to thank Dr. Indra Behra, who was so ever gracious in agreeing to MC the event today. So we have come to an end to an exhilarating evening. Before this important night ends, we would like to felicitate RDG for his dynamic leadership and his contribution to make ICMR what it is today. We would like to call our general in chief on stage and wish him a fantastic journey ahead in his life. I would request Dr. Rajnikan to please come forward on stage. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Director NIN to please come on stage. Next, sir, director, name, director, name, and names, and his team. They would, they do want to like uh, felicitate you. I request him and the team to please come on stage. Thank you, sir. I would just request to please come on dais and say a few words. Thank you so much uh, for an excellent uh, afternoon today. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to uh, congratulate both uh, Kaushik and Rajnikant and their teams for having an excellent event, uh, which is now set the benchmark for ICMR version 3.0. I used to say ICMR version 2.0 while I was working, and now I think a benchmark has been set for ICMR version 3.0. And with the, the media and the responsible media who have been here and educating us on healthcare communication, I think uh, it was a fantastic uh, afternoon and I would uh, really uh, congratulate all the people who have been working on, on, on this uh, event and making it very successful. I would also like to thank all the directors of the ICMR institutes, the scientists and uh, the office bearers for, for coming for this uh, event and gracing this occasion and uh, and giving their love and affection on my last day here uh, at ICMR. So uh, thank you for all your best wishes and uh, I look forward uh, to be interacting with you in every which way and if any, I can be of any help. I also, I also would like to emphasize that if I have uh, ruffled some feathers during my tenure, please for <laughs> forgive me for the same, but it is only for 
uh, my, my intentions were for ICMR, were for India, and were for uh, for the good of mankind uh, at at large. And then the, the efforts were, as we discussed, I was uh, the the face of the work that you all have done, and uh, I hope I have been able to represent to your satisfaction in terms of. Uh, uh, being the face of your organization. I'm sure uh, this organization is uh, a 111 year old organization. It is going to flourish and I'm, I see a very bright future with more than 800 scientists now with 27 institutes. I see no reason why uh, we cannot match the best in the world. And I can see that today's ex event is an example that without any international players, uh, this was done so phenomenally well with, uh, with uh, all Aat Nirbharta that, uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, I, I would congratulate all of you with uh, Aparna um, Sanyal with, uh, and her uh, filmmaking and the, the examples that she showed uh, with um, Kaushik Ghosh and the photography, medical photography, with the five panel discussions that we had right from uh, from uh, uh, the Covaxin journey to to the use of uh, new media and the new social media. I think uh, this is uh, uh, hugely satisfying for me that uh, that ICMR is in, in, in the best of health and is going to do, do the best. And long live ICMR, viva le ICMR. All the best. I forgot to mention the, the, my relationship with Dr. Abai Bang, who is here, and uh, I thank him for traveling all the way from Gachiroli to come for this event um, and, and bless us with his uh, blessings. He was the, one of the earliest uh, public health specialists who was trained with, uh, uh, with um, um, Johns Hopkins. And I think uh, uh, today we can proudly say that we have your students who can train people like Johns Hopkins in India. All the best. Thank you so much, sir, for the touching my words. Uh, I think after what he have said, I don't think I need to say, say any more words. I, there was a formal word of thanks plan, but I think he has said it all. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Now I would just request to everyone to please take a, a group photograph that all the directors and NCOs we want to have with sir, and post that we'll proceed to dinner in the Rose Garden. Thank you so much.